If you all can take your seats, we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon and welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'm Sarah Allender, Deputy Director and Senior Fellow in the Global Health Policy Center here at CSIS. I'm going to apologize at the outset for my scratchy voice. I'm recovering from a throat infection. But it's my pleasure to invite you here and welcome you here today for our session highlighting the five years of the Saving Mothers Giving Life Partnership. Thank you for all of you who've joined us in person and to all of you who are joining us via webcast. All protocols are observed. I'd like to start by thanking USAID. We gotta do it. <laughs> I'd like to start by thanking USAID for their partnership in planning this event, particularly Claudia Morrissey Conlin, Jonathan Lebrecht, and Amy Fowler. I'd also like to thank Alex Bush on my team for his help in organizing and executing today's event, as well as Raven Martin and CDC for their support. Saving Mothers Giving Life, or SMGL, was designed in 2011 as a public-private partnership comprised of the U.S. government, Merck for Mothers, Every Mother Counts, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, Norway, and Project Cure to dramatically reduce maternal mortality in low-resource, high-burden countries in sub-Saharan Africa. On the U.S. government side, that also included the State Department, USAID, the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, or PEPFAR, and CDC. The SMGL approach was piloted from June 2012 to May 2013 in eight poor rural districts with high levels of maternal and newborn deaths. There were four chosen in Uganda and four in Zambia. The goal was to reduce maternal mortality by focusing on the period around labor, birth, and the 24 hours postpartum, the period when two out of every three maternal deaths and 45% of newborn deaths occur. SMGL used a district health system strengthening approach combining both supply and demand side interventions to address delays in seeking, reaching, and receiving quality obstetric and neonatal services, which are the three key delays to uh, accessing effective maternal care in a timely manner for all pregnant women. During the first 12 months of implementation, both Uganda and Zambia achieved a 35% reduction in the maternal mortality ratio in SMGL-designated facilities. Over the next four years, SMGL expanded to a total of 13 districts in Uganda and 18 in Zambia, building on existing PEPFAR and USAID-supported host government and private maternal, newborn, and child health facilities and in alignment with and guided by host country MNCH policies and programs. For phase two, which ran from January 2014 to October 2017, changes were made to the model for implementation to focus increased attention on newborns, expand the time frame of focus to 72 hours postpartum, and build better relationships with maternal, um, Ministry of Health counterparts by inviting them to join the SMGL Leadership Council. The partnership also expanded to Nigeria, implementing the same systems approach in Cross River State. I had the good fortune to work on SMGL myself as the PEPFAR country coordinator in Uganda from 2013 to 2015. I saw firsthand the tremendous life-saving benefits that SMGL has had for families, mothers, fathers, children, and their communities in Uganda. And I understand the tremendous amount of effort that went into making SMGL a success. I'd like to recognize those in the audience who've also been part of the SMGL effort over the last five years. Uh, if you're here from Uganda, Nigeria, or Zambia, could you please stand? Thank you. I'd also like to recognize members of the Leadership Council. Another, oh, there are many in the panel that's coming up, so we'll let them sit for now. Uh, and as well as U.S. government staff from the USAID Secretariat, PEPFAR, OGAC, Peace Corps, Department of Defense. It's nice to see so many familiar faces in the room today. On behalf of the SMGL team, I'd also like to offer a very special thank you to Claudia for all of her work in leading the SMGL Secretariat. I know I speak uh, particularly for the Leadership Council members in thanking Claudia for her service. Thank you, Claudia. <laughs> I 
We'll hear more from our country representatives, our leadership council members, and U.S. government leaders over the course of today's session. We have three panels looking at lessons learned from SMGL and how the SMGL approach can be sustained for the future. First, I'd like to introduce Dr. Mitchell Wolf, who will present the findings from the five years of SMGL. Dr. Wolf is currently Chief Medical Officer and the Acting Director for the Centers of Di for Disease Control and Prevention's Washington, D.C. office. Dr. Wolf. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, There, uh, six years ago, the U.S. government and private partners launched the Saving Mothers Giving Life Initiative, or SMGL, and I'm very honored today to participate um, in recognizing this remarkable partnership and its achievements. When I entered public health, it was with the intent of being involved in meaningful and effective initiatives that would make an impact and have long-term significance, so I'm especially honored to be talking about this initiative. It's evident to, me, evident to me that you all also share this aspiration through your commitment to reducing maternal and newborn deaths among the most vulnerable populations. And it's also clear that the countries of Uganda, Zambia, and Nigeria share these goals and are willing to invest in programs like SMGL to improve maternal and infant health outcomes. So as you know, Saving Mothers Giving Life was launched in 2012 because we knew then, as we know now, that it's unacceptable and heartbreaking that mothers and infants would die of preventable causes related to pregnancy and childbirth. SMGL aspired to achieve the unprecedented goal of reducing maternal mortality in half in targeted districts in Uganda and Zambia within one year, and further to sustain these reductions for an additional four years and to expand to additional countries. SMGL's approach focused on the three delays model of contributors to maternal health. The delay in the decision to seek care, the delay in reaching care, and the delay in receiving quality health care once the women, woman has reached a health care facility. <clears throat> Evidence-based interventions focused on the critical period of labor delivery and 48 hours postpartum when most maternal deaths and about half of newborn deaths occur. The objective was to improve access to, demand for, and the quality of facility delivery and availability of basic and comprehensive emergency obstetric and newborn care, or EMUNC. SMGL also aspired to strengthen links to other essential services for women and children, including, oh, sorry about this. I think I'm pointing it at the wrong place. <laughs> I might ask you to push it if you can. Ah, there we go, sorry. Um, so um, antenatal care attendance and birth planning. Oh, sorry, it doesn't seem to be working. Minor technical difficulty, sorry. Perfect, thank you. Let's try this. All right, let's try this. Uh, SMGL also aspired to strengthen links to other essential services for women and children, including antenatal care attendance and birth planning, HIV prevention, care and treatment, and family planning access. All right, let's see. Perfect. SMGL established an extensive monitoring and evaluation framework to document the health impact on maternal and perinatal deaths in SMGL districts. Multiple data collection approaches at the community and facility levels were implemented to document changes in SMGL facility infrastructure and care and maternal and perinatal health outcomes. When possible, SMGL enhanced existing health management information systems and PEPFAR data collection. Other data collection activities included a costing study, an ethnographic study in Zambia, and an external evaluation of SMGL's initial proof of concept year by Columbia University Mailman School of Public Health, and intervention-specific assessments carried out by implementing partners. I'm now happy to be able to share some highlights from Zambia and Uganda. 
Over the five years of implementation, the district population maternity mortality ratio in Uganda declined from 452 to 255 maternal deaths, as you can see on this slide, per 100,000 live births. And in Zambia, from 480 to 284 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. These are substantial declines in population level maternal mortality and show that the districts were able to sustain the initial declines achieved during the phase one proof of concept period of SMGL. Maternal deaths in SMGL healthcare facilities also declined. In Uganda, SMGL facilities, the maternal mortality ratio decreased from 534 to 300 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. And in Zambia, SMGL facilities achieved a decline from 370 to 231 maternal deaths per 100,000 live births. Healthcare facilities achieved sig these significant de declines primarily due to averting deaths from obstetric hemorrhage. Compared to the baseline, both Uganda and Zambia facilities achieved significant de declines in maternal deaths due to obstetric hemorrhage, a decrease of 42% in Uganda and 65% in Zambia. SMGL training and mentoring strengthened the provision of life-saving MONC and was a likely driver of this decline. Because improving maternal mortality requires the engagement of multiple systems, it's important to point out that the improvement in other indicators that had to converge in order to save women's lives. First, the SMGL districts achieved significant increases in the proportion of all deliveries taking place in healthcare facilities. Increasing facility deliveries was a central focus of SMGL initiative because we know that delivering in a facility greatly improves the chances of surviving childbirth. Facility deliveries increased from 46% at baseline to 67% in Uganda, and in Zambia from 63% at baseline to 90%. In addition to increasing the number of women who delivered in facilities, the quality of care in these facilities was improved and their ability to provide more comprehensive care. SMGL improved the ability to deliver the full range of emergency obstetric and newborn care services by strengthening infrastructure and the ability of essential drugs and supplies. In both countries, the number of facilities able to provide MONC more than doubled. By the end of SMGL in both countries, 40% of women delivered in facilities equipped to provide MONC. A critical component of comprehensive MONC is the ability to perform C-section deliveries when necessary. In Uganda, the C-section rate increased from 5.3% to 9%. And in Zambia, the rate increased from 2.7% to 4.8% 4 of births. This remains slightly below the 5% WHO recommended minimum C-section proportion, highlighting one of the challenges that persist at the conclusion of SMGL. Additional factors that likely contributed to this improvement in access to emergency care include, as you can see in the picture here, transport and transport vouchers in Uganda that improved access to newly opened emergency services, training and supportive supervision of healthcare workers, and in Zambia, the construction of maternal waiting homes, which were instrumental in getting women closer to a facility around the time of delivery. SMGL also established and strengthened the Maternal Death Surveillance and Response, or MDSR, systems to make sure that maternal deaths are counted and to better understand their causes. In Uganda, the percentage of hospitals that routinely conduct maternal death investigations increased from 31% to 94%, and in Zambia, from 50% to 100% over the course of SMGL. The establishment of these maternal death surveillance and response systems in conjunction with SMGL has received strong support from the country governments, increasing the likelihood that these efforts will be sustained after the SMGL initiative is ended. SMGL made great strides in addressing conditions to improve neonatal survival as well. By championing, championing and increasing essential newborn care, providing on-site mentoring and procuring equipment. The percentage of facilities that reported having performed newborn resuscitation increased from 34% to 88% in Uganda and 27% to 75% in Zambia. In Uganda, improvements in facilities included significant enhancements of neonatal intensive care capability, neonatal recession training, resuscitation training, 
implementation of kangaroo mother care and the use of the baby's matrix, a simple facility-based surveillance tool that links maternal and perinatal outcomes with evidence-based interventions. In Zambia, implementing the Helping Babies Breathe neonatal resuscitation program also aimed to improve neonatal outcomes. In Uganda, perinatal deaths declined from 39 deaths per 1,000 births to 34 over the course of SMGL. More analysis remains to be done, but the less dramatic declines in perinatal mortality compared with other outcomes indicates we still have more to do to prevent perinatal mortality. We cannot be complacent on this issue. So what has SMGL taught us? First, by working in partnership, we can achieve significant reductions in mort maternal mortality. After unprecedented declines in maternal deaths in the first year, some were skeptical whether those the districts would be able to sustain the lower levels. In fact, they redoubled their efforts and were able to sustain significant declines over the remaining four years of the initiative. Second, when health events are counted and accounted for, people and institutions will pay attention. The implementation and strengthening of maternal death surveillance and response systems at the facility and district population levels was instrumental in bringing needed attention to the need to plan for a birth to understand the warning signs of a serious complication and to have access to a facility where complications can be addressed. Availability of data to document SMGL achievements also increased the political awareness necessary to garner greater government investment and ownership. While we celebrate what we have achieved, we still have far to go to improve women's and neonatal survival and health. The organizations that have invested in SMGL are to be acknowledged for the significant declines in maternal mortality, but we cannot stop here. Ongoing improvements will require continued government investment and ownership. Maternal mortality is declining but remains too high, and perinatal survival will require much more intensive focus in the future to achieve comparable reductions. Given the investment that country and district governments made in SMGL, the training and education that were part of the initiative, the expertise of the many people who carried it out, and the obvious success in improving health outcomes, we feel very positive that the SMGL initiative will have a lasting impact. So I end today where I began with genuine respect and appreciation to the many partners and people that worked incredibly hard and made this possible, and thank each and every one of you for your participation and commitment and congratulation to you on these really outstanding outcomes. SMGL has undeniably raised the bar in how we address maternal mortality. Thousands of people's lives have changed for the better because of these efforts. The achievements show that what is often seen as an intractable problem can be addressed with the right leadership, resources, and political will. Saving Mothers, Giving Life has had and will continue to have a significant reach and impact. Thank you. Thank you all. Can you hear me? Is this mic on? Thank you all so much for being here, and we are excited to start out with perhaps the most important panel, because in fact, having the representatives from the countries that were implementing Saving Mothers Giving Life is a great honor for us. And of course, those are the learnings, and that's the roots of the sustainability that we are all hoping uh, this program will, will see in the years to come. So I am delighted to introduce to you our first panel, uh, where we will have reflections from the partner country experiences from the three countries that participated in Saving Mothers Giving Life. My name is Janet Fleischman. I am a senior associate here with the CSIS Global Health Policy Center. And I also have had the opportunity to see many of the SMGL programs over the years from its earliest days until some of the recent uh, findings that we have just heard from um, Dr. Wolf. And I think that the opportunity to now hear directly, uh, briefly from, uh, with opening presentations from the country representatives, they'll speak for about three to five minutes with just some key takeaways from each country. 
and then we'll have a conversation a bit about some of the other issues that are common and different among the, between and among the countries, and then we'll open it up for some questions from all of you. So I won't go into all their bios because you have them in front of you, but I'd like you to, let's welcome Dr. Jessica Nsungwa Sabiti, who is the Acting Commissioner for Community Health at the Ministry of Health in Uganda. We have Dr. Kennedy Malama, the Permanent Secretary uh, for the Ministry of Health in Zambia. And Dr. Inyang Asibong, the Commissioner for Health for Cross River State in Nigeria. So, so we have the right people here to give us some of the key learnings from their countries and then to engage in a discussion about where we're at, what are the opportunities and challenges going forward. So why don't we begin with um, Dr. Nsungwa Sabiti and we will hear about a few key lessons from Uganda. Uh, thank you for having us here. Uh, in Uganda, this uh, work on saving mothers, giving lives, was able to ele elevate awareness on the need for the country to finance and reach the targeted uh, plan, uh, uh, resources required for the plan. We have learned that there's a need to finance infrastructure so that when there are life-threatening situations for mothers, which often happens in pregnant mothers who are usually previously normal, they have to have the safe delivery places. We have also learned that there's a need to finance additional human resources and not only increase the numbers, but also deploy them in the right places. We have also learned that uh, there's a need to have the life-saving commodities in easy reach. And would like to thank the, the, the people who, did the, who supported the team to do the implementation because of the rigorous evaluation we were able to visualize, especially the leadership in government, to see that it was feasible and workable, but also able to demonstrate uh, reduction in mortality in only one year. The other thing we have also learned is that we need to do close monitoring and documentation of the outcomes and the processes of care, including quality of care, and continue using this information for decision making. The three delays model enabled us to be able to cluster where the mortality was happening and target the interventions. And again, we'd like to thank the support from this program because we were able to, for example, in the first delay, to target the mothers who are not able to access these services, including payment vouchers, which allow them to be transported to the health facility and therefore increase the demand for the services. We also, through the three delay model and the data, or information, we're able to leverage services from the private sector, especially emergency health services, for them to have C-sections in time. We learned that these mothers needed to have care within at least two hours of delivery, and we, we like that kind of support. So the whole idea of investing more, we don't want to have plans where there is no investment, and government has taken next steps to mobilize the money and fund the processes to reach the budget levels. We have also learned that uh, from this uh, close monitoring that there is a need also to involve the communities so that they also participate actively. Most mothers were not delivering the health facilities and the close documentation and counting of the deaths which was factored in this process enabled us to see the mothers in the facility. The first time we began this process, we, most health work, workers believed that there were no deaths occurring until we started counting the deaths in the communities with the community health workers and this opened up a chance for mothers to be reached and targeted. So those are the main messages we learned from this process. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So Dr. Malama, can you speak to us a little bit about the lessons from Zambia that are similar but different from what mm. we heard from Uganda? Thank you very much. For Zambia, we believe we're investing in health is key, and the government of the Republic of Zambia is taking that very, very seriously. Whatever we are doing in Zambia, it's informed by our national development plan, 2017 to 2021. So the key question is how do we domesticate that as health? And this is where now we've developed the National Health Strategic Plan, 
2017-2021. So for us in Zambia, the Saving Mothers Giving Life has been a game changer because it's speaking to the broader government aspirations. Addressing the key three delays fits in very well in what we are doing in Zambia. Number one, we know that Zambia is predominantly a rural country. 70% of our people are in the rural parts of Zambia. How do you generate demand for them to access healthcare services? So Saving Mothers Giving Life was catalytic in that aspect by harnessing the game changers in the community. In Zambia, nothing moves if you don't engage traditional leadership, for instance. So with Saving Mothers Giving Life, we use that to generate demand for health services. But it's also important to note that as you generate demand, you need to look at the supply side of things. And this is where now infrastructure improvement comes in key, provision of equipment, ensuring that you have skilled attendance in those facilities. Classical example in Saving Mothers Giving Life is the construction of the mother's shelters, as you've heard in the presentation earlier on. So that gave us quick fixes in this program because we saw our mothers fighting, scrambling actually to go and seek healthcare services because they know when they present themselves, they'll be put in these habitable shelters, wait for delivery to come. But also what is important is to ensure that we are able to count all those deaths which are occurring. Because for quite some time, we were not paying particular attention to the community incidents. With saving, uh, saving Mothers Giving Life, we are able to amplify that. And we started getting closer to the real picture. So it's important to note that the results we've scored as Zambia is giving us an opportunity now to move forward. Also, what we've done as a country is to come up with what we are calling legacy goals. Where do we want to move as a country 2017 to 2021? So setting of those targets has been informed partly by the Saving Mothers Giving Life. For instance, we are saying as Zambia would want to reduce the maternal mortality ratio, now countrywide, from the current 398 to less than 100 by 2021. Very ambitious. But we are convinced if we build up with what we've achieved, we can, we can get those numbers. And also let me mention that political support, political will and awareness in Zambia, we are seeing unprecedented levels, where at all levels, national level, provincial level, sub-district levels, the political arrangement is highly involved in ensuring that adequate support is given. Because as you are aware, you can have all the resources, you can have all the support, but if the political will is not there, it's not adequate, then you'll be fragmented. And as I conclude, just to mention that um, with Saving Mothers Giving Life arrangement, the way the consortium supported us, it has been a carrot we've dangled. And now we've seen more partners coming to the party, or now we can form this consortium. And in Zambia now, we have what we are calling the Ramkan, Continuum of Care, where we have the US government, UK aid, CEDA Sweden, the World Bank, coming together, trying to support one plan through the leadership of government. So Saving Mothers Giving Life has reminded us nothing goes if government is not in the driving seat, and this is what we've seen. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, uh, and Dr. Asibong, obviously the program is more recent in Cross River State, and yet you've still achieved some very important results. Speak to us a little bit about the key takeaways from Nigeria. Yes, um, so many of them. One of them is collaboration. We've um, realized that collaboration is key among governments, among um, the partners, and even among... No. Hold on, we're going to bring you in. Okay. Wait, there so you go. On, uh, okay, we got it. So among governments, among partners, and even among governments to partners. So um, for example, um, within the government, we have what we call the intersectoral collaboration, 
where other sectors that still have to work with health come together to see how, what we can do to improve reproductive health, maternal and child health. For example, um, you have the Ministry of Works coming in to repair the roads. That's one of the delays that comes up when we are talking of maternal health and delays in access in healthcare. So we have our roads being worked on, especially access roads to those facilities that are in the clusters that we are using. And of course, we, are, we also learned coordination being very important, coordination among the partners and somebody actually taking a lead role in making sure that um, this works. And that's where the government comes in. Also, we learned that advocacy is very key. The governor of the states is actually um, well informed about the Saving Mothers Giving Life project. In one of the meetings, he was um, personally there at the meeting to give his um, um, support politically. And this has helped because whenever he, he has to know what, um, what we have to do as a state to support the program, he's always um, very eager and um, very willing. Also, um, stakeholder engagement, different stakeholders, especially the community participation where we start with the stakeholders in the community and then get down to everybody in the community. We have what we call the emergency transportation services, where we have local transporters in the community actually working to make sure that pregnant women get to access to care or get to a health facility on time. So we have them um, registered and we, have, we give these numbers during the clinics to these women. It has been very helpful. We've had instances where mothers were actually bleeding, um, pregnant women were bleeding, and we had to call these people, and they actually came immediately, leaving everything um, that they were doing. So community participation is also key. And another very important thing is data. Um, before now, we were not really uh, having our data as well. We were not um, recording it on time. But with this project, we realize the importance of data. For example, if the, the opinion leaders actually get to know, okay, this is what we had on baseline, and we have had a reduction in maternal mortality rate of 28% within two years, that is quite huge. And that without data, we cannot achieve that. And that actually gets them to listen. So, um, of course, data is, um, is key there. And, um, um, all the, um, we have different, um, the Hello Mama, the Hello Mama is actually the, the digital um, communication with these mothers, where during the antenatal clinics we get their phone numbers and we try to prompt them, they have prompts of when to come for antenatal, what to take um, during pregnancy and even goes on up to a few weeks after birth, how to take care of their children. So I think it's a, it's a uh, combination of different things, not just one particular thing. Thank you so much. <laughs> so let's take some time to understand a little bit about some of the factors that contributed to the successes and that may be keys to the opportunities and challenges of, sustain, of sustaining these programs. So Dr. Malama, let's, speak, let's begin with you. Can you speak to us about the importance in Zambia of the PEPFAR platform for Saving Mothers Giving Life? Thank you very much. Um, allow me to take this opportunity to thank the American people for their unprecedented support to Zambia in the HIV platform, but also many other platforms. What we saw with Saving Mothers Giving Life it's a leverage with the existing programs, projects, more so the PEP for support. Uh, the progress made in Zambia, for instance, in the HIV response, most of the successes attributed to PEP for support. So with saving, uh, saving Mothers Giving Life, we are able to leverage that support. There is no need to reinvent the wheel. If system strengthening has already commenced, saving mothers giving life built on those already existing uh, systems. For instance, when you look at the issue of uh, health information management improvements, within the PEP for support, there's something already which has been taking place. So when the saving mothers giving life came on board, we had to navigate what are the strengths with the CDC support, for instance, already in those districts and we are able to, to get those benefits. 
So it's important to note that um, for saving mothers giving life, the success we are talking about, part of it is that it was not starting afresh. It's to appreciate what was already existing and then we we're able to build on that. And one of the challenges that you've already raised is the question of financing going forward. How, um, Dr. Jessica, how, how would you say that the Saving Mothers Giving Life process and program in Uganda has informed the global financing facility investment case that Uganda has put forward? So World Bank investment, GFF investment going forward based on some of the learnings of SMGL. So right from the, after the first year when we learned about the first results, we made, uh, we decided to benchmark this model. So we developed a new plan called the Sharpen Plan and we put it forward to the government for funding. And we, we, we initially we didn't have money, we looked at the money because the good thing about this map, in addition to costing, we were able to map the resources available. And it was very clear that government had to chip in the funding. Initially, we were not one of the GFF countries, so our minister traveled to Addis Ababa and lobbied for the GFF funding, and we got $30 million, and the country matched this grant with $110 million. We took a World Bank loan to support this model, and right now we're implementing it since October. Since that time, we have also been able to rally other partners, because by securing this common understanding in this plan around this model, we've been able to mobilize more resources from CEDA and, and uh, the Canadians to support the whole model. So right now, as I talk, almost two thirds of the funding is secured now. And we are now running for the first year, the implementation of the money we have mobilized. And next month, we are going to have our first meeting to look at the progress, how the model now is being expanded in the whole country. And uh, our patron, the first lady, is going to lead this process. So we have the parliament behind us. We have the biggest leaders behind us and the whole system is trying to support us. So we're looking forward also to have, to mirror the same image which is driven by the country. We are also working now with the private sector, with the GFF, with like trying to establish a private sector platform, an area we think actually will take us beyond the domestic financing. And uh, last month when the budget was read for the health sector, we have been able to increase the budget and the discussion now which is going on is being able to allocate more resources for women and children we discovered very early from the beginning that because we were not mapping the resources and tracking them, it was very difficult to know whether actually there was an increment in the funding for women's health and children. So now we have uh, an electronic-based system for tracking the resources, and every year we have an annual assembly, and partners are going to be reporting where they are putting money because they've made commitments. So we are tracking both the commitments, but also we are tracking to see where exactly the money is going, in terms of interventions and also how much is going to the district. So there's a lot of movement around that process and we are hoping that with this assembly we're going to hold in August, uh, led by the first lady, we'll be able now to look at how we can even mobilize more partners. And we're very grateful because it, it, it took just one year's proof of concept for people to visualize that actually if you converge health system interventions in one place, you can act dramatically save more lives. The other issue we're also trying to mobilize resources for is that uh, after the first experience, we actually learned that whereas we were able to save the lives of mothers, we didn't do as much in terms of giving lives to newborn babies. So our new area of emphasis now is the newborn mortality, which we are putting more emphasis on. And it has become very clear that if we are going to save more lives, we need to invest in infrastructure. And now there's a system going on through the GFF to establish NICUs, newborn care units, in the country. And the design has been made. And we are hoping to benchmark also from other countries on establishing these newborn care units. And also do preterm birth surveillance. It's an area where we have not been counting. So again, we have established a system for counting the preterm birth. And we have two centers of excellency, including establishing skills labs to build the skills of health workers to manage these babies. So we are hoping that come the next two, three years, we are going to be focusing on how to roll out this plan in the rest of the country. We are also doing performance-based financing because we realize that health workers need only not have the, 
to be, to be in adequate numbers, but we need to make sure that we motivate them, but also we make them accountable. And right now, training has taken place in half of the country, about 56 districts, and we are going to now roll out the PBF, again, which is a government-led program. So we're so grateful that we've been able to clone this same model, and now it's, it's embedded in our new plan, and we are now implementing the plan. Thank you. Dr. Asibong, you're in a unique position because it's just one state that is implementing this program. What are your relations with and dialogue with the national authorities and other state governments uh, with a view to potentially implementing this going forward? Yes. Um, um, Cross River State is the only state I'm handling this. We have 36 states in the country. But um, we engage with the minister, and we engage with the reproductive health department, the Federal Ministry of Health. As I speak with you, we have an ongoing national. It's not done. Excellent. But we really are not hearing you very well okay. at all. Any of you, any of you, except for the gentleman who is speaking. All right. Can you hear it this way, if we speak yes. very, okay. very close to the mic? So we engage. <laughs> we engage with the national um, government, the federal ministry, the, ministry uh, the minister for health, the Department of Reproductive Health. Actually, we are also working with the federal ministry in the states, because they, uh, in a way, um, should I say, supervise in some way, what the state government does. So even as we are doing the SMGO program, they are also part of their activity because um, partners cannot come into the state without passing through the federal government. And um, as I speak with you, we have a national council on health going on. It's the highest decision-making body on health in the country. It's going on concurrently with this meeting. And um, in that meeting, we have a presentation already. My permanent secretary is making a presentation on the SMGL project. So it's going to be presented, and all the state commissioners will be there. All the partners are there. The minister is there. And it's, um, it's going to be presented today about uh, the lessons we've learned and um, um, the success story and recommendations. And we hope that it's going to be adopted um, by the national body so that it can also be disseminated to states. So that's one of the things we are doing in the national level. And then for the uh, community engagements, of course, like I mentioned, we advocate to the governor, to the stakeholders in the community, and even to the pregnant women themselves. Another major set of people we work with are the traditional birth attendants. You cannot take them away from the health system of communities in Nigeria. It's part of the culture. So we have trained them on how to recognize danger signs in pregnant women because we've tried to tell them stop. We've even tried in other ways to um, teach them another form of trade, but it's really difficult. So while we're still doing that, we are trying to um, engage them to recognize danger signs so that they should only take the normal deliveries. And when there's a, a danger sign, they can actually refer to the hospital on time. And there's one more thing we are doing, the mother-baby care card. This is very innovative. It's not been done in the country before. We've always had antenatal cards and then the baby card. So for the first time with SMGL, we are integrating the mother's care and the baby's care together in one place, in one card. And we have found that this, is, this has been um, um, very, very helpful. So thank you. So, in the interest of time, I'm going to ask you all one last question and before we open it up to the audience. And that is the bigger question about sustainability. Really, what keeps you up at night? What are, you, what are your concerns going forward about keeping these programs going? So let's start here and move down the line. OK, so for sustainability, we believe this is going to be sustainable because of things we've kept on ground. First and foremost, we've built the capacity of our health workers very well. And um, they are now trained to handle, especially basic uh, emergency of obstetric and newborn care, which was not um, done in many of our facilities before now. 
And um, another major thing we've done also, of course, the provision of equipments. Equipments have been provided um, to our facilities through this project, and the, the, mm, the health workers have been trained on uh, how to handle this uh, these equipments. So that's another major step on uh, sustainability. And also there's the, the government's will, because already I told you that uh, maternal mortality rates has been reduced by 28%. I mean, there's nobody that sees that and wants to go back to what we were, we were before. That's why I said um, data is very important. So, and also domestic um, resource mobilization. The government has tried to also support this project um, with matching funds to make sure that um, this goes on. We've also had engagements. The, the government of the day knows that this project is ending very soon. So there have been engagements on how to make sure that this is sustainable. And in addition, please, in your response, tell us what are your big concerns about going forward? Because there's a lot of systems that have been put in place that we hope will be sustainable. But there are also some big roadblocks and barriers ahead. So please address those as well. Thank you very much. For Zambia, all of you, I can see in the audience, there are so many partners who have been part of this family. Don't abandon the countries yet. <laughs> Yes, we've scored so much success together, but this is the time to sustain them. Three key words, comprehensive, to scale, for sustainability. So this is not the time to back off, we need to move together. For Zambia, we are sure of sustainability. Number one, it's because in our overarching plan for Zambia, the National Health Strategic Plan, which speaks to the National Development Plan, Lessons learned from the saving mothers giving life, including some of the practices, they've already been included, even in the guidelines for Zambia. So we already have a business plan, so to say, which will continue selling to so many partners. And it's important to note that uh, some of the partners who were part of the saving mothers giving life are still in Zambia and will continue with that collaboration. There are some who are not part of the saving mothers giving life who have shown interest in this consortium to buy into the National Health Strategic Plan. So we are confident. But also, the local ownership in Zambia is quite ripe. We are seeing, as government, also increasing domestic financing for health. For one example, in 20, 2017, we had about 8% of the total budget going to health. For 2018, we are almost 10%. Our target over the years is to ensure that by 2015, can we reach the 15% which Zambia has committed itself to. So sustainability assured on two fronts. One, government increasing the financing of the health sector. Two, making it attractive to the partners to come on board. Traditional partnerships and the emerging partnerships. We are very optimistic that we should be able to do that. But also the Zambians themselves believing in this agenda. I think with the results we've produced, which in most cases you take 15 years, 20 years to achieve what we've demonstrated with saving, uh, saving mothers, giving life. So the evidence is there and everyone is very attracted to this, including the ordinary Zambians. In Zambia today now, when there is a maternal death, health workers are being asked a lot of questions. Family members where that death has occurred, they are also being asked questions. And this is the stage where we are. So we, we are sure that oh, we are on the road to sustainability, especially if the partners in this audience do not run away. We need to continue. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. Um, as I said, we started scaling up and thinking about this process of adopting and integrating the model in our sector in 2013. And we've been at it for a long time, so it's until 2016 that we're able to mobilize resources. And we are quite positive that we are going to increasingly be able to put more resources in government. But having said that, we have some specific challenges. For example, we have a big uh, population growth in the country. Uganda is one of those countries with the highest population growth, so we need to make sure that the country puts this on the top of the agenda, the demographic dividend. 
We also have an increasing number of NCDs, both for HIV and non-HIV patients. We are seeing more patients than mothers with NCDs, non-communicable diseases rather, which is also a problem. The other issue is quality of care, centering quality of care for these mothers, especially making sure that these mothers have respectful care. They are all accessing care in a timely manner. So quality of care now is increasingly becoming one of the key things we want to focus on. We are learning here, but we are also uh, making sure that this is the main focus. The other issue is the multi-sectoral approach. Having more non-sector players taking some of these responsibilities, including religious leaders who play a very important role and can support us in these teenage pregnancy issues, early marriages. So we'd like to widen the platform and make sure that we have other players. We also are one of the countries with the highest number of refugees. Uganda is third in the world with the highest number of refugees. We have refugees from our neighboring countries and we are experiencing more mortality in some of these populations. But again, the leadership is taking on this. And of course, finally, the local capacity. And I think everybody has mentioned this. It will not be possible for us to have systems, health systems, which are resilient to the shocks we get once in a while if we don't continue building local capacity. And this will take us some time. So we still hope that this process needs to be nurtured. This process needs to be studied. We need more evidence. We need information so that we are able to improve and take this to the next level. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. So we've touched on lots of issues, but I'm sure there are many more that you in the audience would like to raise. So we're going to have a little time for some questions. We'll take three at a time. And we'd like to uh, please ask you to introduce yourself and your affiliation. And we will have someone come around with a microphone so that uh, you can be heard by not only the room, but the people who are watching on the webcast. So let's begin over here. Thank you. I'm Lois Kwam from Pathfinder, and I was a part of the uh, initial team that worked on saving mothers. And one thing we debated was um, whether it was helpful to set such a high goal for Zambia and Uganda of a 50% reduction, or whether that could be uh, unmo dis uh, un uninspiring. Could it inspire or uninspire? And you came so close. And I'm wondering how you experienced uh, having such a high goal set. Other questions? Oh. I'm Steve Wall. I'm from uh, Saving Newborn Lives, Save the Children. Um, I'm interested actually in the, uh, the neonatal part of this. Um, you achieved really remarkable results, of course, uh, maternal, and I wonder if you could just explain a little bit more as to what you think might have been uh, perhaps uh, slowing down the, the gains in, in, in uh, newborn uh, survival and particularly looking at your model of access, demand, and quality, was there any one, one, any one aspect of that that stood out with respect to neonatal mortality? And one more question. We'll go in the back. Thank you. I'm Gary Merritt. Uh, <clears throat> my career mostly in USAID in public health and 20 years in Africa. Um, I was struck in scanning through the report uh, that no mention was made of some of the most powerful uh, proximal determinants of maternal survival, and that has to do with the age at first pregnancy and to do with the spacing between births and to do with the ultimate number of births such that mortality is uh, uh, directly a product of uh, that. Did you in your analysis control for changes in any one or all of those parameters as before and after? And I'm particularly keen to pose the question regarding your country's policies and your perception of underlying public views about family planning 
with respect to maternal survival issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have three questions. One, Lois's question about the ambitious goal, and was that helpful to you, or was it detrimental? The second one, about the neonatal mortality issues, and the third, about family planning, and the piece that that played in the program, and that may play going forward. So I'm going to pass this mic again down the line. You can take any piece of those questions, and then any last message you would also have for the US government. Um, as you wrap up. So we will start with Dr. Asibong. Okay, so I'll start with the last question. Um, determinants of uh, mortality, age at first pregnancy. Actually, we worked on this with the Saving Mothers Giving Life Project, where we were examining the first time mothers, first time mothers and its effects on pregnancy and childbirth. And, um, we're still working on that, but the preliminary results have actually shown that um, um, family support is very important at that age, especially teenage pregnancy. Many times the outcome is not good um, when this, uh, in teenage pregnancy, but if they are married or they have a support system, uh, these first-time mothers always do better, and the mortality is also lower. And then um, also for the policies, of course, when we have our health policies, we have a state strategic health development plan, it's a five-year plan, and we have the state health policy, which is very particular about um, reproductive health. And um, for the family planning policy right now, in the states, um, Cross Shiva State has the highest fertility rate in the South-South region, that's my state um, of Nigeria, so we are very particular about family planning. But of course we have some challenges. Some religions do not advocate family planning. In fact, it's common knowledge that the immediate past president of the country was trying to advocate for family planning, and he had a lot of challenges on this, and he had a lot of people who said they were not even going to vote for him in the next election because he's trying to reduce the population of the country. So um, cultural barriers have a very significant influence on family planning, so we try to uh, work on this with caution. But we have engaged the community-based um, groups and also the stakeholders to try and create demand um, on utilization of family planning services and we're already seeing this as yielding results. Dr. Malama, why don't you take the uh, ambitious goal piece mm. since you were there at the beginning. Thank you. If we could do it the same way. <laughs> I think it's time we became ambitious, and I think uh, saving mothers giving life has just demonstrated that. Uh, and if you look at the Zambian uh, National Health Strategic Plan, you are going to see very ambitious targets we've set ourselves. And it's clear that uh, if you set your targets and uh, you galvanize the investment with the appropriate team on your side, it's doable. And this is what saving mothers giving life demonstrated the issue of bringing various partners together with their comparative advantage. We have Project Cure, we have specialized in mobilizing equipment, and so many other partners who are very good in what they do. I think that's the game changer. So yes, we are proud of the targets we set, and it's very clear that it had a lot of issues when we set those targets in the beginning. And people thought, this is not realistic, you are not going to meet halfway. So it's good to sit here today and look back and say, we've done it. For Zambia, for 1% reduction, I think it's time to celebrate is as good as 50%. <laughs> now, moving forward, I'm sure we'll know how to reach the 50%. Let me also mention that um, teamwork is very critical. Partnerships are very, very key, and this is what we've learned. As I conclude, maybe just to address your other question you mentioned, to the US government, I think it's important to continue listening to the local people, very key. Saving Mothers Giving Life has shown us that solutions actually lie in those communities. As poor, as rural, as remote as they may be, they know what needs to be fixed. So it's, it's very, very important to listen to what the local people are saying. 
The other passionate appeal would like to make is the issue of when you take an approach of health system strengthening, it means each, each, each building block is very key. You forget or ignore one building block at your own peril as a program person or people who are investing. And therefore, we are appealing that infrastructure in the African setting is one of the critical ingredients for you to improve health service delivery. On two fronts, in some places there's no infrastructure at all, in some places it's dilapidated and highly compromises health care. And therefore we appeal that in whatever sources of financing we continue to receive, can we ensure that we prioritize infrastructure development? Thank you very much. The neonatal. Uh, yeah, yeah, before I talk about the neonatal, Incidentally, the target, for example, which was set in Uganda, this, when we started this process, both government and the US partners and the other partners were all involved. And there was a big debate on this target. And government actually wanted an 80% target. We were very much convinced, our minister was very convinced that if we can scout all these mothers out, we, 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 we did a calculation and we said, we have 1.7 million mothers delivering every year. And the argument was, we can actually scout them out and account for them. So we had actually a more ambitious target, and I think that it's been a very important inspiration for us to adopt this model. We did not have any difficulty adopting the SMJ model. And for those of you who have had a chance to read the Ugandan Sharpen Plan, it's basically the SMJ model. So we didn't have much difficulty. In any case, it inspired most of the work because when the results came out, remember in Uganda, we, took a, we delayed in, in starting because we had to do the bidding, the infrastructure, the recruitment. It took some time. So I believe if we had begun in time, probably would have gone beyond 40%, and we're going to continue with that. Newborn mortality in Uganda is still an area we are very much interested in understanding. We just had a demographic health survey uh, last year and we found that actually more babies are dying among the teenage mothers. We have more babies dying in the urban areas. We have more babies dying in the slightly literate people. So we've just commissioned a verbal autopsy, which is going to begin to understand further. But we have a, a theory. We think that in the previous years, there's been more emphasis on strengthening community newborn care primary newborn care, and we think that if we are going to make another dent, we need to move away and have more specialized care, especially for the preterm births and the sepsis. Sepsis is still a big problem or infection, and the preterm birth. So we have now commissioned a big preterm birth surveillance system, and we are taking advantage of technology, innovations, and we have a prison program, which we think is going to support us to scout and understand what the issues are around newborn mortality. But there is a clear relationship with young mothers and mothers who don't deliver in the health facility. It's very clear that we need to reach out to these mothers. So we, we need programs which look at both community health systems, facility health system, and even more advanced care. The time has come to improve the infrastructure and the care for babies in a more advanced way. So we need to have all those things happening at the same time, and that's how I would like to move. We have also commissioned uh, a strategy and a framework to target the adolescent girl. We have many challenges of young marriages. We have many challenges of young mothers, of uh, abortion in the young people, and uh, which is often unsafe. So we have also just commissioned a framework for the adolescent girl child. And uh, this framework is not housed in the health sector, it's housed in the Ministry of Gender and Culture, and again, it's being spared by the First Lady, because we think we have a big, uh, we can get better gains if we target the young people, as I mentioned earlier on, given the high population and the high birth in this age group. Well, I wish we had more time, because so many of the issues that we've been discussing uh, about the multi-sectoral response, about addressing adolescent girls and young women, about the health care workers and the mentoring and the financing and the scale-up. Each could take a whole panel on them. 
in and of themselves. But I think all of us are feeling very confident that these programs are in your hands, and I'm sure many of us will be eager to come visit you to see how this evolves going forward, and hopefully to work in ways to sustain U.S. engagement and financing and investment in these critical areas of saving mothers and giving life in these countries, and hopefully others that will take this model up. So please join me in thanking our panelists. Our AV technical difficulties today. Um, so we'll go ahead and keep passing this mic uh, and see if that works. Um, pleased to start our second panel here um, with our leadership council members. Uh, as we mentioned earlier in 2011, 11 organizations came together to leverage their strengths, fill gaps, and ensure that the SMGL systems approach was effective in reducing maternal and newborn mortality. Our second panel, uh, panel features four organizations that served as integral members of the SMGL Leadership Council. First, Dr. Marianne Etibet. I'm a little out of order in our line, but you bear with me. Dr. Marianne Etibet is the executive director of Merck for Mothers, which supported SMGL by guiding the strategic direction of the initiative, supporting on the ground program implementation and evaluation, and initially serving as the secretariat. Dr. Herbert B. Peterson is the past president of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, which provided essential technical guidance to the secretariat and clinical training and mentorship for frontline health workers. Dr. Douglas Jackson, here on my left, serves as the president and CEO of Project Cure, which provided customized supplies, equipment, and related services and conducted on-site needs and post-assessments, supply chain management, and medical supply and equipment delivery services. Our final panelist there on the end is Jessica Bowers, who serves as the grant program director at Every Mother Counts, which worked to raise public awareness, advocate for SMGL and global maternal health, and improve transportation and referral systems in the countries. Thank you all for joining us today. So we brought this panel together to hear from the leadership council members uh, about their reflections on SMGL, what brought them to the partnership in the first place, and their observations and reflections on how the partnership was implemented and for sustainability in the future. So let me, uh, we can just, I think, go down the line if we can. I'll start with you. Dr. Jackson. Great, thank you. In thinking about this, I thought a little bit about a, alliteration because I love alliteration, so I have five Ps. Someday they're gonna invent a pill and I'll have a cure for this, but for now you get to suffer through my alliteration. The first P is people, and I go back to one of the first meetings that we had, and it was Claudia Conlon and Naveen Rao and Bert and Christy Turlington and I think it needs to be said, you know, there's so much written right now about alignment and teamwork and Jim Collins talked about, you know, the right people on the right seat on the right bus. And this was one of those groups that showed up and everybody checked their ego at the door. And I think that a lot of the success of this program is because of that. These are some of the nicest people I have ever had the privilege of working with. And that thread carried through the fabric of this entire project uh, to the staffs when we went out on site and we met the doctors and the nurses to the people in the health ministry the smags these safe mother action groups what a terrific group of people who got on board and said it's not about ego and it's not about 
uh, some big me too, uh, oops, sorry, That's a, I guess we can't use that anymore. <laughs> it's all about me thing. It's, it was really about the focus on we're here to change the world and that's kind of a, a very, very important part. The second P is puzzle. There were so many moving parts to this thing when we got started. We had problems with data collection. We had problems with engagement, uh, you know, between uh, this hospital and that clinic and the ministry and the United States government and the NGO sector. We had issues around moms who couldn't afford to get to the hospital and so they just didn't go. We had issues uh, about what are we going to teach. Uh, we had issues, and this is where Project Cure came in, where we had really well-trained doctors and nurses who didn't have any tools. It would be like if we had the greatest culinary school and we said, hey, we're going to cook dinner tonight. Here's a snare drum and a screwdriver. And by the way, we're out of stock on chicken and fish, rice and pork. Dinner's at six. And a lot of the folks just said, thanks, but this is going to be really, really difficult. And we can't do this. And this group of people got together and each person had a piece of the puzzle. And they started to put this together, and today, five years on, this is what we have. It's a really beautiful picture that came out of people taking their own piece of this puzzle. The third P is progress, and uh, I want to tell Amy Green on my team, thank you for putting these statistics together uh, for us. We have a very small team at Project Cure. We're only about 35 paid employees. There's a, an army of about 25,000 volunteers across the United States, and so when we're talking about the American people, we're talking about a grassroots effort that is in Denver and Phoenix and Nashville and Houston and Chicago and Philadelphia. And I have told these volunteers about this program a thousand times and reaching across the ocean, they said, thank you. We want to be a part of this. We want to help our friends in Uganda and in Zambia and in Nigeria. For our part, we did 43 needs assessments in Zambia, delivered 19 40-foot containers to 52 health centers, about five and a half million dollars of GIK. We've done 15 post evaluations and that represents about 13,900 volunteer hours in Zambia. 29 needs assessments in Uganda, 16 containers, 45 health centers, nine container support trips where we sent people over to help to unload and, and uh, plug stuff in and make it work. 12 post evaluations, 4.6 million in gift and kind, 11 1,728 hours. Nigeria, and we're still working in Nigeria, we haven't finished yet. 19 needs assessments where we went on site, talked to the doctors, talked to the nurses, and said, what is it that you need? 17 shipments, 60 facilities, we got 41 more coming in 2018. Nine container support delivery trips. Uh, we're currently evaluating uh, the results three and a half million and 12,461 volunteer hours. And that was the commitment that we made to be a part of this team. The fourth P is praise. I was just in Zambia, I just got home last, yes, uh, got here yesterday. And I just want to relate two quick stories. We were at the Cowboy Hospital and one of the people who came was the former minister in the Eastern Providence. And he said, when this whole thing started, he said, in my hospital, the problem was is that they started bringing these moms with, um, with all kinds of pregnancy issues. Uh, they started bringing moms with eclampsia and all of this stuff. And he said, my mortality rates skyrocketed. And he said, I kind of panicked because everything that used to be handled out in the field now was landing in my hospital. And he said, I didn't know what to do. And he said, three weeks later, a container showed up. And he said it had everything in it that we needed. It had delivery beds, it had operating tables, it had suction, it had uh, gloves and gauze and suture and all of those things. And he just said, that completely changed everything with Saving Mothers Giving Life, showing up and showing up with the resources to make sure that we could handle the challenge that we had just been given. I was standing there with all of the doctors and nurses. The first lady was there. Uh, I started to get a little choked up. He did too. We kind of fist bumped and walked away. <laughs> Claudia and I were out in the field and we were meeting with the SMAGs and these people are absolutely incredible. They've got their shirts and they've got their uh, black bicycles and they're going out into the communities and talking to the, to the pregnant moms and they're saying, hey, you need to come in here. And we talked to them. One of them said, you know what you did? You made it cool 
to take care of moms. You put so much attention and resources into this thing that now it's a, it's a neat thing to have one of these bikes and one of these shirts and go take care of the moms. That kind of change of history can never be undone. The fifth P is path forward. Where do we go? Dr. Kennedy, you said, don't leave us. This is not a divorce. It's not a funeral. This is a graduation. <laughs> and I already gave you our commitment from Project Cure in front of your first lady that we're going to continue until you say, thank you. We've got it from here. We don't need you anymore. That's what every NGO ought to strive to do is to put themselves out of business. And so for Uganda, Nigeria, and, and Zambia, that's what we're here to do. The corollary is, is that this program needs to become apolitical. The public pressure on all of us to continue this has to supersede politics. Whether a mom loses her life should not depend on who wins an election. And that's the commitment that we've got to have going forward. And finally, this works. We weren't so sure when we started, but this is proof of concept. The worst thing that could happen to saving mothers giving life is to put all of this stuff in a box, just like the end of Indiana Jones, and shove it into some warehouse over here someplace, and we forget about it. This needs to be shouted from the rooftops, it needs to be made available, it needs to be open sourced, it needs to be communicated to everybody else that this was a program that actually met success and it works, and we need to pass that on, and that's what all of us in this room get to do from here forward. <laughs> Doug knows that I, I'll work with him shoulder to shoulder on any day, but I don't like to follow him on a panel. <laughs> <laughs> we were all excited uh, as our ACOG leadership team walked into then Secretary Clinton's offices uh, in the State Department. and. Uh, Milan Verveer, Lois was there, Milan Verveer welcomed us and said, here come the doctors. <laughs> and, and, and we were so enthusiastic and optimistic uh, because uh, we really believed that SMGL was going to save mothers and babies. And we wanted to be a part of that. We saw in, in the potential, at least in part, because there were two elements of SMGL that were part of every global health success. And one was the will to do it, and the other was the way to do it. And on the will front, uh, one of our ACOG fellows, uh, dear friend, beloved colleague, many of us in this room, uh, Alan Rosenfield, had written that landmark piece in The Lancet, Maternal Mortality and Neglected tragedy. And he, along with other visionary leaders like Mamou Fatala, who said, women are not dying because of de diseases we can't treat. They are dying because societies have yet to make the decision that their lives are worth saving. Mm -hmm. And we had that great breakthrough with the Millennium Development Goals. And, and for the first time, global leaders gathering together and declaring their commitment to dramatically reducing maternal mortality. And within just a couple of weeks of, of the launch, Dr. Fatala uh, was giving an address to us. There were thousands of us OBGYNs gathered from around the world. And he said, and you could have heard a pin drop, maternity is not a disease. Maternity is the means of survival for our species. Women have a right, a basic human right, to be protected when they undertake the risky business of pregnancy and childbirth. And his masterful address was entitled, Imagine a World Where Motherhood is Safe for All. We could see that vision and we could see SMGL as our opportunity to step up and answer that clarion call. So that was the will part for us. Uh, on the way front, uh, Alan and his colleagues at Columbia had already 
uh, developed our understanding that maternal deaths were occurring in large part because of these three delays that we've heard about. The delay in seeking care, the delay in reaching care, and the delay in receiving quality care. And we saw in SMGL that being right at the heart uh, of the approach. The, the other uh, thing that Alan and his team had already done was to, through the Averting Maternal Death and Disability Project, is to help us better understand why women were dying. And until that project, it wasn't as clear as it was afterwards that a high proportion of maternal deaths were occurring because of complications of childbirth. And we were simply not going to save mothers' lives without the availability and accessibility of high quality emergency obstetric and newborn care services. So we had to get those in place. And we saw that at, at the heart of the SMGL approach. Another component of the way that we saw in SMGL and had us so committed from the word go was that we realized that the only way to put these services into practice in the context where the vast majority of maternal deaths are occurring is to take the systems approach that we just heard about. Being able to strengthen systems sustainably so that these life-saving interventions could be in, put into practice and serve the women who need them most. I was, uh, it was great seeing Jim McCauley there. Jim, Jim and I, uh, in the first SMGL leadership team visit to Zambia, shared a four-wheel drive vehicle. And we had been at an urban facility where those emergency obstetric services were available. And you could see that a woman who delivered that night in that facility had a high probability of surviving. Uh, we went in this four-wheel drive for an hour and a half. Uh, I remember like yesterday, Jim turned and saying, it's going to get bumpy, and it, it seemed to get pretty bumpy. And then he later turned around as we were going like this. He said, now it's bumpy. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but we could see the challenge that a woman who delivered in the facility in that village with no running water, no electricity, uh, and a heroic nurse uh, uh, being there, uh, if she delivered that night in that facility, she had uh, a, a vastly lower chance of survival, except for the Safe Motherhood Action Group that we got to see, mm -hmm. and realized that a community through an intervention like SMGL that was implemented successfully could help us with those delays stabilize a woman so she can reach those services that can't be provided otherwise in that setting. That was another reason that we were committed to SMGL from the word go. And finally, uh, on the way front, and we've heard it uh, already addressed so well, is that the SMGL model had the potential to be able to do what we were doing in the intervention districts. Uh, in a way that could be replicated, could be scaled, and could be sustained. And that gets us right back to Mahmoud Fatala and talking about making sure that every woman everywhere had the right to be able to access these life-saving services. All women everywhere. And so as we reflect on our uh, ACOG role in SMGL, uh, we do so with great appreciation because we understand fully that it was the doctor's great privilege to be part of the SMGL team. Thank you. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Marianne, and as uh, Sarah mentioned, I'm here representing Merck for Mothers. Um, I think we are actually at a very special moment in time. I loved your analogy as a graduation. And I just want us all to reflect on um, the actual audacious goal that we all set for ourselves and the fact that we pretty much achieved it. And I don't know about any of you, but I don't know of too many population, uh, uh, too many programs that have shown population level impact of reducing maternal mortality rates. 
it's not there, and saving mothers giving life achieved it. And I actually think that deserves a round of applause for everybody, Claudia, I see all the USG partners, um, you know, the Leadership Council, uh, it is something that we should be proud of and is something that we should not let go of. Um, we talked about, or Doggy talked about how at the beginning uh, it wasn't clear what necessarily the solution would be or what the different roles would be, but we had that North Star, and I think um, I wasn't there at the beginning. It was Dr. Naveen Rao, uh, who uh, is uh, for a couple more days now uh, the lead of Merck for Mothers, uh, who was there, and he's always told me that if you can develop trust amongst the partners, uh, you can really do anything. And I think it was that commitment uh, to developing trust uh, that has really served the partnership well uh, over these past you know, five plus years. And so to come back to that trust and Merck for Mothers uh, being the private sector partner here, um, we are a $500 million initiative of Merck. Uh, our vision is that no woman anywhere has to die giving life. Uh, and we think that we have a role to play in this global agenda uh, because we can bring that private sector perspective uh, and expertise uh, to the challenge, uh, specifically around how is it that we innovate uh, uh, public sector, sorry, public-private partnerships, um, as well as think about the role of public sector on the ground. And I mentioned those three things because I think saving mothers giving life uh, really uh, allowed for that type of approach. From the beginning, uh, it was very clear that this would be a comprehensive uh, systems-based approach and thus an opening uh, for the role of private sector, not only in terms of resources and funding, but also in terms of uh, the partnerships that were developed at the country level and the solutions that were implemented at the community level. Uh, and I'll share a, a little story uh, around that. Um, one of our roles working in Zambia uh, was to improve quality of care, you know, an essential component, uh, with the midwives uh, that are working at the community level. I think we often forget many midwives are actually social entrepreneurs. You know, they, they put up their shingle and they're the ones servicing the women in their community. And so we worked uh, with them, uh, with PACE, uh, which is an affiliate of PSI, uh, to improve uh, quality of care, but also for them to develop business skills to increase their capacity to see more patients uh, and uh, to be, uh, expand services in their community. And I think through that capacity building, uh, we, we, we've talked a little bit about the ripple effects of saving mothers, giving lives, not just on health, uh, but on communities and on the development of nations as a whole. Uh, but I think the experience also talks about, uh, we've also seen the development of the folks who have been working uh, in saving mothers, giving life, but that by that investment in human capacity development uh, and how that has had ripple effects uh, throughout the system. The, uh, the other thing I'd like to mention is often we forget that almost 40% of women uh, seek care uh, from local private providers, and we're not going to achieve the sustainable development goals for reducing maternal mortality unless we think about uh, how these women are receiving care and what level of quality of care they're receiving. And that's why it was also so important for us to work with Cross River State uh, and Pathfinder uh, to create integrated referral networks that included both local private providers and public sector providers so that any woman would not be further than two hours uh, from emergency uh, uh, obstetric care. And I think that is showing dividends. Uh, you talked about even including the traditional birth attendants uh, in, in that referral system, so it's not just linked to the institutional uh, structure, uh, but also the community. And I think it's that spirit of innovation and iteration uh, that be, uh, began at the beginning, as you said, when everybody went into that room, that has continued uh, throughout Saving Mothers Giving Life and has allowed uh, for us to reach that audacious goal. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to 
claim it, you know, uh, rounding up to the <laughs> rounding up, uh, rounding error, 50% uh, uh, reduction uh, in maternal mortality. Uh, I will say from a Merck from Mother's perspective, uh, it has been an honor to be part uh, of, of this partnership. Uh, and it's some of the lessons that we have learned from this uh, are definitely informing uh, our investments, uh, both current uh, and moving forward. So thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Jessica Bowers, representing Every Mother Counts, and our founder and CEO, Christy Turlington Burns, who is very sorry she couldn't be here today to graduate with her fellow graduates. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to echo a lot of what other folks said. Um, Dr. Kennedy talked about the ambitious nature of SMGL. Um, I wasn't there at the very beginning, but Christy was talking yesterday about that meeting uh, with Secretary of State Clinton, Milan Verveer, um, and just the excitement that was in the room and what followed after that. Um, I actually started my job on a Wednesday at Every Mother Counts and flew to Uganda on a Thursday t for an SMGL trip, um, so I was very much thrown into it. But um, we were excited about the holistic nature of, of um, SMGL and the fact that it was addressing all of these demand and supply side barriers all at once. It was like they'd thought of everything. Um, and just the possibility there for the women um, that were being impacted. Um, I think Saving Mothers Giving Life is a testament to what can really be achieved by a group of people who come together who are dedicated and have the knowledge and the deep bench of expertise, um, and it was just at all levels. Um, and also helped to have Claudia there to constantly wrangle everybody um, and keep us in line. Um, Every Mother Counts supported uh, in Uganda the BODA for Mothers program run by Baylor College of Medicine Children's Foundation Uganda. Um, it was a incredibly successful program. Women uh, bought subsidized vouchers that covered their transport on a BODA, BODA taxi motorbike to get their prenatal visits, their delivery, uh, referral if they needed it, and postnatal visit. Um, Baylor Uganda successfully transported, I think, about 100,000 women to care um, over that time and trained over 1,200 boater riders. Um, there were, uh, you talked about some of the ripple effects. You know, I'm, one thing that really stands out to me is um, with the boater riders, they were also really engaged in community outreach um, and they were often called upon to deliver, help deliver mothers en route um, because mothers, you know, it's, it could be rainy and often it took a while to get there or they called kind of late. Um, and at their request, we um, supported some education for them on, on maternal health and how to handle deliveries um, and what to do in those situations. And they became really passionate advocates for maternal health in their communities and spread that locally and with their families. Um, so it's pretty amazing. Um, I guess I'd also just, just echo that um, from this partnership, we've, we've learned a lot. Um, it was a big investment for our very small NGO. Um, we were also tasked with doing some of the advocacy and communications around it, um, which could be challenging at times. I mean, I think we all know that health system strengthening is not the sexiest term, and it's kind of hard to... Um, to convey all of the aspects of it that make it a success um, in this social media, um, small, you know, media bite world. Um, but at the end of the day, we're tremendously proud of, of Saving Mothers Giving Life and the achievements of the tremendous work of Baylor Uganda um, and this very small role that we were able to play in it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of you. I wanted to pick up a little bit on something that actually both Doug and Marianne touched on, which was uh, the partnership itself and some of the, the unique aspects of it. So I'd love to hear your reflections on what you saw as the innovative aspects of the partnership itself and how uh, each of the partners came together. Doug, you mentioned at the outset uh, that each partner really came to the table with its own capacity and um, comparative advantage. but. How do we you know, take that forward? So what would be your advice as well to 
your own future partnerships or other future partnerships with the U.S. government and other partners uh, to ensure that you have the same sort of a success that we've seen with SMGL. <laughs> I don't have the five Ps, uh, <laughs> which are great. Um, can I steal them? Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so in, in terms of the unique, uh, you know, th this type of unique partnership, I think for us it was unique because it was one of the first times that we were actually engaging in this type of very complex partnership with a large complex uh, uh, program uh, that looked at partnerships not just at the global secretariat level, but also, again, as I said, at, at the national uh, and implementation level. And I think what um, uh, one of the things that we have learned, I think, is that it is important to kind of develop your unique value add uh, and to be able to recognize what that is. Uh, communicate what that is, and even measure uh, what that is. I think we heard a lot about the importance of measurement uh, in terms of uh, engaging key stakeholders. You know, so whether it was being able to evaluate, uh, sorry, being able to share and communicate progress uh, and how that uh, helped with momentum uh, and buy-in at the provider level uh, enabled you to uh, uh, persuade governments uh, to uh, fund uh, the program. Program. I think it also uh, allows you to bring in new types of partners uh, to any enterprise. Uh, and so that's you know, one of the things that we've learned from this is the, the importance in being able to measure your unique value add and, and communicate that uh, in terms of bringing more, more partners uh, to the field uh, or, or, or to the enterprise. I think the, the other key insight, and um, I'm so glad uh, uh, you talked about the GFF in Uganda. Uh, I was constantly struck uh, by the fact that uh, the theme around leveraging partnerships, leveraging resources, creating building blocks of foundations, investments in uh, healthcare system infrastructure, uh, the unsexy things uh, that are critical uh, for the success uh, of, of any health program. And for a, an initiative like Merck for Mothers, uh, this is not necessarily something that we can bite off. Uh, you know, we, we <laughs> it's not necessarily something I think any one uh, partner can bite off. Uh, and so the lesson of SMGL is that it does create, uh, it does um, uh, prove that you do need a coalition uh, of partners, not only to bring that special value add, but to bring the scale of resources needed to make that key investment in infrastructure and multi-sectoral non-health solutions uh, that are needed for maternal mortality uh, and other key global challenges, uh, that scale is needed to show impact. Uh, and so the more that we can share the lessons of uh, the fact that we were able to bring so many partners to the table uh, so that we could achieve scale and implementation and show impact, uh, I think that that's one of the key lessons learned of SMGL. Would any of you like to add on? Mm -hmm. awesome. Go ahead. Doug and Marianne have, have said it all. I, I think on the partnership, the 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 partners are partnering to do something, and and it's that vision and mission that brought us together very purposefully. And uh, when you think about a similar moment in September 12, 1962, John Kennedy says we're going to go to the moon. And, <coughs> And about the same time that we had SMGL, that, that, that vision was realized, and, and it took partners uh, to come together to do that, uh, mission-driven, you know. And, and the other part of this that I think, uh, I want to just thank again Claudia and, and, and the team, because you have to have a mission control. Uh, the partners have to be able to be organized and, and, and managed in a way that they can function efficiently and effectively to work together to achieve the mission. So I, I think that was another key, key part of our success. I was gonna say vision, and you're absolutely right, Bert. Um, alignment, there's a thousand ways that we could have gotten off track uh, with just a whole bunch of different stuff.
politically, internally, whatever. And I would echo uh, what you said about Claudia and your team and, and the leadership, because you kept us aligned. You kept us focused, right? This notion that no mom should ever die giving life is something that is a mission that goes all the way through this entire program. Everybody got it. We all understood. And then the accountability. Uh, we kept looking at those statistics. Are we doing right? Are we doing right? Are we doing right? And, and that was the thing that kept us focused on what's going to happen after five years. 50%, five years. 50%, five years. Kept coming back to it over and over and over again. I think those are lessons that we can use in every project all the way through. Thank you. All right, we'll go ahead and take uh, three questions from the audience and then uh, have our follow up and then we'll wrap up for the next panel. Go ahead. My name is uh, Debbie Dortzbach. I'm with World Relief. And I was fascinated with uh, Dr. Jackson with the SMAX, the, the su Support Mother Action Group. And in a similar way, I would be interested in knowing have you marshaled the faith communities, of which there must be tens of thousands of them in your three countries, and what lessons might you have learned, or what path forward do you see? Okay, great. Another, any other questions? Okay, one right here. Hi, Susanna Ogunte with Africare. I wonder, just because it's so expensive and it is health system strengthening, when you talk about costing, resourcing, and cost effectiveness, which me measures did you find most effective? Which, which ones would you kind of pick on? Um, and what would you advise someone who's thinking about maternal mortality health system strengthening in terms, in terms of measurement to focus on? Great. Any other questions? One more right here. Okay, thanks for having we need more to save the children. Uh, great partnership, lots of, I was looking at the list of partners and they're all uh, global partners. So I was wondering moving forward and for the country, maybe this is more for the countries, but to what extent were there attempts to include private sector from, uh, from, the, lo from the countries themselves? Great, thank you. Okay, the first question was on SMAGs and engaging the faith community. Doug, did you want to address that? I got to tell you, I don't know how they selected those people, uh, SMAGs, and what the community represented. I'm not sure. Here's the one thing I am sure of. Every one of those people that I met was so committed that all you wanted to do was hug them, support them, dance with them, thank them, and send them back out to keep doing the work that they did. Uh, I, I don't know if that was a faith-based thing, if it was a vision thing. I'm not sure. That would be a great question for our friends from the ministry. Um, but when people are really engaged in doing the right thing, there is a, a passion that grows that is absolutely palpable. And every time I met any of those people in the field, they were deeply committed to change in the future of their country. Save the hard question. <laughs> <laughs> the next one was on costing. Uh, who would like to address that one? Do you want me to? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I, I'll try because I, I do think about this. I, I don't know if I have the answer, but you know, I think it is important uh, to think about cost effectiveness. Uh, but I. I encourage all of us to think about it uh, through a broader, wider lens uh, and not just look at the costs that are going into a single uh, program or project and limited outcomes of that project, uh, but think about the broader impacts. Um, and it's hard to do. Uh, I think the other thing uh, in terms of that cost uh, outcome uh, equation is looking at the inputs. And so often you're just looking at uh, the input from one partner. You're not looking across the whole value chain. Uh, and thus again, uh, you know, that can skew uh, your, uh, your results in terms of cost effectiveness. I think uh, the GFF, you know, platforms where countries uh, are able to get their arms around uh, their priority healthcare needs uh, uh, prioritize them, uh, have common uh, uh, indicators uh, with which to measure success, 
uh, funnel uh, funding from multiple sources, bilateral agencies, multilateral agencies, private donors, domestic, uh, uh, you know, local private sector, uh, then you're able, I think, to get a better handle uh, on what the cost effectiveness is, is because you have all of the inputs and all of the outputs. And I haven't seen to date uh, a really good way uh, of uh, analyzing that. So maybe you will be the one uh, to, to show us all how to do it. And thank you. Uh, on the effectiveness part of cost effectiveness, that, that for accountability and for making sure that we're on the right trajectory to get to the moon, uh, is that we have to have uh, accurate measurements to see where, where we are. The part that's a bigger challenge, and, and we, SMGL made important strides on, and we need to continue to make further strides, is as we implement these life-saving interventions, we have to understand what's working and what's not working, why it's not working, because if we look at replicating and scaling, we have to have lessons learned that can help us uh, do that more quickly uh, and more successfully uh, as we replicate. So it's that under measuring what we need to measure to understand how we succeed in putting these life-saving innovations into practice. Uh, just to add in terms of measurement, um, I think Saving Mothers Giving Life benefited tremendously from the CDC and some other research institutions that were involved. Um, and so trying to partner with some of those research institutions that might, you know, be able to even do some of low bono, pro bono work um, in measurement. And then I would, I would say, you know, I think a lot of um, organizations now are really looking at some of those less quantifiable aspects, um, which are some of the things that we try to invest in, like the provision of compassionate care, um, and how do you measure that, um, and trust in a provider. Um, so those are just the thoughts that I have on that. Let me just echo that contribution from CDC, which was just immeasurably important to the project. our last couple minutes I'd love to hear some maybe final or charging thoughts for from you all on um, how to keep the momentum going we've heard wonderful things from our, our country leaders about the um, the ownership that they've taken on onto the SMGL model and incorporation into their national guidelines but uh, where do we go from here from your perspective in terms of uh, advocating the SMGL approach being taken on in other countries or um, taking this sort of uh, whole arsenal targeted uh, approach into other aspects of global health? I guess the thought that keeps running through my mind is that last scene in Schindler's List where he's standing there and he, he, he realizes that if I would have just sold my lapel pin I could have saved a few more. If I would have sold my Mercedes, I could have helped a few more. And I guess I feel a little bit like that, uh, you know, thinking that this is over too soon. But it's not over. This movie's not done. The credits have not rolled. We're not through. And we can continue to do that. And we can continue to use the lessons that we've learned on this. For our part, uh, Amy and my team, <laughs> and this, when I come back like this and I get really wound up about uh, the urgency of this, this is when my team just starts running into the warehouse and hiding in the racks because it's like, uh-oh, Doug's back. This is going to be a problem. But it's just that commitment for us to, to continue to do what we said we we're going to do. We're looking at uh, helping moms survive and doing a whole lot more teaching and training around some of those issues and some of those things are things that we have learned here. Some of those are commitments that we've already made to the three governments that are sitting here about continuing the work that we're going to do. And some of it's going to be uh, going out and grabbing friends and saying, hey, we just did the coolest thing. Would you like to come and play with us? Would you like to be a part of this thing? Because the best thing in the world, the most fun thing in the world should be philanthropy. It should be helping other people who can't necessarily help you back. And that's what this is all about. That's, uh, th th that said it all, uh, I I'll just say that, that, that there's way too much goodness here to do anything but keep on keeping on. <laughs> Thank you. 
Um, I actually think um, the previous panel you know, really showed us uh, what the path towards sustainability is, and I do think it has to be country-led. Um, and uh, you talked about you know, not just the mechanisms around the global financing facility, but national strategic plans, uh, dissemination uh, and uh, replication within other states within the nation. And I, I, I do think that that is that nexus for sustainability, and it's, it's our responsibility responsibility at, at the global level to look for those types of systems uh, to contribute to uh, as opposed to uh, thinking about uh, new uh, initiatives or, or new programs that, that are not contributing to country-led uh, uh, systems and priorities. Um, speaking from our perspective, which is a much smaller uh, scope, I think, um, you know, for the Baylor Uganda program, we've given them a grant to try and transition the transport voucher program uh, into a community savings and loan program where members can draw upon um, some of the savings to help with um, transport costs and other health related costs. Um, and then I would say furthering that just investments at the community level, I agree. Um, I think for us, you know, our value add is probably investing a lot in the community health workers and in that pipeline of um, the midwifery workforce, which is so valuable, um, and the skilled birth attendants who really act as a bridge to the community. Um, yeah. Okay, well, thank you to all of you. And um, can we have a round of applause for our leadership council members? <laughs>
is giving life. And we are very honored to have such a wonderful panel to be able to talk about these issues um, from the perspective of different government agencies, different positions during the time of SMGL. Um, and we are very honored to have Dr. Alma Golden, who is the Deputy Assistant Administrator in the Bureau of Global Health at USAID. We have Ambassador Scott DeLisi, who at the time of SMGL, when it was started, he was ambassador to Uganda. And we have Ambassador Deborah Burks, who is the US Global AIDS Coordinator and the Special Representative for Global Health Diplomacy at the State Department. I also uh, have to acknowledge, as others have, that there are people in the audience who were instrumental through the US government agencies uh, in taking this incredibly ambitious program and working together in an inter interagency fashion and doing some very creative work and some very, um, uh, and have achieved some extraordinary results. And in particular, I see that Christy Mikus, who was at PEPFAR at the time, and Jim McCulley, who was at CDC at the time, both of them part of that incredible team that was in Zambia, and many others who are here. Um, it's really an example of what the US government can do when tasked with a seemingly overly ambitious goal, uh, able to work together in an interagency fashion, able to work with their country partners, with the private partners. It's really quite a tale that we are uh, telling today and hopefully that we will learn lessons for other such partnerships going forward. And as the last panel said, hopefully this is not the end, a sort of a graduation, but also a continuation. Um, and this is an opportunity, as I said, to hear from the U.S. government partners, because this has been a very important investment from the U.S. government agencies. And we are going to start out, as we did before, with a couple of brief opening remarks from each of you. And then we'll have some time for questions before we open it up to the audience. So why don't I begin with Dr. Golden? Well, it is an honor to be here. I'm thrilled that CSIS is uh, hosting us today, and I want to thank you for all your good work on this. I do want to just uh, say that it's a real pleasure to celebrate at this point in time, and also just to honor the ama amazing partners. I wanted to comment uh, or pick up your puzzle uh, analogy, because that is something I've heard from my office, too, that this was the right place and the right time to bring the right people together to make things happen. And along those lines, I, I do want to just take a privilege of having Dr. Conlon stand up and recognize the amazing hard work that she's done. So, <laughs> um, under her uh, leadership, uh, USAID had the privilege of hosting the Secretariat, and we, we acknowledge and appreciate the comments that you've made about the leadership there. And we, wanna, we, we just celebrate that we were able to do that, and we look forward to how that coordination goes forward in the future as well. Uh, I do want to uh, acknowledge that uh, we've learned a number of things in this process that our offices talked about and shared, and, and among those things, we learned that we uh, need to align, and I've heard that word multiple times, we need to align priorities and goals. We need to talk about them and examine them to be sure they're the right ones that we want to work on. We need to give ourselves enough time. And I want to, I'm very grateful that we had at least the five years because I think it did demonstrate, and even just listening to our country partners talk about how you built infrastructure, how you built communication, how you built political will, I think that's, that was a very wise decision at the very beginning, and I applaud all of you that worked on that. I also want to acknowledge that uh, data is critical to success. And if most of you are aware that Mark Green, who is the administrator for USAID, has made a very clear priority that we are, we are helping our partner countries on their road to self-reliance. We're really aiming for sustainability, for stability in the countries that we are in, for building capacity that's enduring. And I feel like this particular initiative initiative really does set, set the baseline for the data that we need, the experiences that we need, and the capacity to help our country partners really develop their own programs that will 
be sustainable into generations to come, and we're very grateful for that. Um, we recognize that uh, it takes good communication, it takes shared vision, it takes training, and I think that's something we learned about, training health partners and health professionals, and it takes a lot of political will, and it takes thoughtful, careful uh, philanthropy too, in order to make all of this work together. So it's our honor, we're thrilled to be here, and thank you for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Dr. Golden. I'm gonna turn now to Ambassador Burks. Great, so um, let me just start at the beginning because um, I wanna just recognize Lois Quam because she came down to CDC um, and I wanna take you to where we were at that time. We were talking about GHI and we were talking about intentional integration and what that should look like and how it should be done. And Lois Quam came down to the CDC and talked to us and laid out her vision. She was at the State Department in charge of the State Department's integration of GHI. Came down and really talked about what she wanted to do and what her goals were. And I talked to her afterwards and I said, I have a brilliant um, PhD <laughs> that you should talk to um, and she could work with you, Anjali Atricker. And, um, we're really excited about doing something intentional in GHI to show that it could work. So two, partnership grew, two partnerships grew out of that dialogue um, in 2010. Um, so I think that one of the reasons this was so successful is we took all of 2010 and 2011 to no mobilize the original resources um, and to go to country and work with the front offices and the government to really see if there was political will to make this happen. Because when a Secretary of State announces a program, you sort of have to know it's gonna be successful. You can't just launch a program that you don't think is gonna be successful. And so almost 18 months of really intense planning went into this to really see whether we could get the data at the site. So PEPFAR put in $75 million, about half of the partnership. And people may say, well, why did you do that for saving mothers giving life? And the team at State also came up with a saving mothers giving life, you know, I think that's really a great way to put it. And I think, Names matter, and so everybody kind of got bo on board with that name, so thank you come, for coming up with such a catchy name. And so the reason we invested in it, because at that time we were launching in PEPFAR a, a thing known as B+, um, to ensure that every pregnant woman had access to ARVs, which means every pregnant woman had to be tested. And at that time when we went to the sites and we had Jim McCauley um, in Zambia, and we had Sarah Allender, in Uganda, and they really came and told us where the problems were. These are the things you're gonna have to address, and the number of women who aren't coming to the clinic, they're not coming to be tested. So we really felt like if we had something more comprehensive that women needed and wanted, that women would come for their HIV tests if they knew there was going to be comprehensive care there that really appreciated them. Now, I can tell you, because we're only talking about the positives, there was a lot of pushback. And I can tell you there were partners who came to us and said, it's not worth that much money to save a woman's life. And I remember looking around and going, wow, we spend that much every year for that same woman to get antiretrovirals, and now we're saying it's not worth it to save her? Um, to get her, you know, to get the physicians there, the nurses there, the transport there. Um, and so we had to go through a whole series of partners to be part of the public-private partnership because a lot of the partners said to us, well, we think that's too much to invest. It's not sustainable. Um, and we said, well, you're at that last mile of MCH and you've done everything else and USAID had done such tremendous work that we knew what was left to do and it wasn't cheap. You know, and sometimes the solutions aren't cheap but they're still incredibly important. And I think that's what sometimes we have to get over that hurdle. And we have to say a woman's life and her baby's life is worth $120. Because um, that's what we were talking about, $120. We were spending 110 on ARVs. So I think that really, is something that as a global community, as we work on these more and more difficult problems, 
We're going to have to really decide, are we willing to mobilize the resources and do we have the political will to do what it takes to really ensure that women and families can thrive and we go into that last mile together. And so we've talked about the amazing success um, and that was successful because these teams on the ground set up these comprehensive data pieces so I think you know PEPFAR is very data driven, so we added indicators. Um, you couldn't get the money, if you didn't add all the indicators and report on the indicators, and not all sites did equally well. And then governments really engaged um, with those sites and our technical partners that you just heard from to make those sites stupendous, so that all sites were equal in their performance because we targeted human capacity and technical assistance where they needed it the, the most. And so not only did you saw the decreased mortality for women and their children, but the a HIV testing rate for HIV pregnant w for pregnant women went dramatically up. And so there is a value on intentional integration. There is a value in intentional health system strengthening in a way that hadn't been done before you know, creating ambulances out of motorcycles, you know, these kinds of things that governments were willing to do. And I, I was thrilled to hear from the government to say that they're very interested in continuing these activities and bringing these to more women. And I really just want to thank Ambassador Storella and Ambassador DeLisi because they're the ones, when we have these ideas in Washington, they're the ones that have to make sure that they happen um, because there's a high level engagement when a secretary announced it. The other partnership we announced that year was Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, really focused on cervical cancer. And I just want to um, thank USAID for transitioning and taking over the secretariat in 2013 and really making it thrive. Claudia, you're really just amazing um, to come out with this level of detail. But I think it's also important to remember that public-private partnerships take time and effort and focus and data and really ha having advocacy in the country. So I want to thank the front offices and the PEPFAR coordinators and the PEPFAR team because a lot of this fell to them because they were hearing from me saying, you better make this work. <laughs> right, Jim McCauley? <laughs> Poor Jim. Um, so, and, and I really want to thank Lois again because this was her brilliant idea and she put the partnership together. Um, so you are here today because she put it this. Thank you, Lois. So now we're going to turn to Ambassador DeLisi, who was in fact on the ground and had to take the charge from Washington and, and help make this happen. So please give us the perspective of the chief of mission when this was all happening. Thank you. Thank you, Janet. Good afternoon, everyone. It would be really easy as an ambassador, as a career diplomat, and a political officer at that, to say, what am I doing here? <laughs> With all these wonderful health professionals, public health experts, people who are so committed and passionate on this issue. And you're right, Debbie, that the secretary had announced this. She was committed to it. But that's not always enough to convince an ambassador or folks in the department in general to really invest themselves in making a difference. So it'd be really easy for me to feel out of place, but I don't. Because I learned about this from the very beginning when, guess who, Lois Quam <laughs> came to see me when I, when I was ambassador in Nepal. And I was, knew I was going to Uganda and she told me that this challenge was looming. And you very quickly realized that although I'm not a health professional, this was not an issue that belonged to USAID, it did not belong to CDC, it did not belong to Merck, it did not belong to Cure, Project Cure, it did not belong to any of us. It was for all of us to achieve it. And I realized very quickly it wasn't just about health. It was about embassy platforms, it was about leadership, it was about coordination, it was about engaging those governments, and that we had to build this unique partnership. Now we've talked a lot today about the tremendous accomplishments of saving mothers giving life, and you're, they are, they were fantastic. But for me as a chief of mission, what was fascinating about this was to have that program as part of an integrated global health strategy. And Debbie, you talked about this a little bit, you touched on something I was going to say. 
For example, our efforts to prevent mother-to-child transmission of HIV-AIDS, the linkages between that tremendous effort that we made and the Saving Mothers Giving Life program, it's something like the light bulbs go on and you say, hey, guess what? This is all part and parcel of what we are doing, and it has to come together. Somebody earlier had asked about, well, did you talk about teenage pregnancies or early pregnancies or the spacing of pregnancies? Indeed, we did. And we talked about it in the context of saving mothers giving life, but we also talked about it in a broader context of development, of building, of building the future for Uganda. We talked about it in the sense of empowering men and women to make informed choices about their reproductive health. And that became not only a discussion about reproductive health, but about making informed choices about health and about their lives and about understanding that there are times where we do not wait for government to come and give us all the answers, where we don't wait for the donors to come in and solve all the problems, but where we have to make these decisions and build the future. All of these things were results of that engagement on saving mothers, giving life, and yes, it was tremendous to save those mothers and to see the difference and see the innovation and creativity that came forward as we did this. And I was tremendously proud of that. And I do, at this point, I just want to say, first of all, thank you to every one of you. Yeah, as I said, as an ambassador, you come in. We know little about health. We know little about most things. We know a lot, a little about a lot of things. But the, we turn to you and we look to you to inform us, to guide us, to educate us, but also to inspire us. And the hard work and the dedication and the commitment that you all brought helped me to tra transform and to change my leadership style and my commitment on these efforts as well. So thank you for that. We talked about what we've done. We talked somewhat about how we did it, these incredible partnerships, that it was truly this unique partnership of government, of private sector, of the faith community, of working with good partners in government, strong governments that cared. The districts that we chose initially in Uganda were districts that brought a tremendous commitment. We couldn't have done it without their leadership and their vision as well. And that path wasn't always easy. And even our partnerships, as you mentioned, weren't always smooth. I might even suggest there was at times interagency competition within the US government, I, the heaven forbid, but it did exist. And that's part of the role that an ambassador can help to play. And I will tell you that unless we all share the vision though, and unless there is committed leadership to engage and move forward, it's not going to happen. The last thing I'll, I'll say, you know, was, uh, you know, we talked about how we did it through partnership and about what we did. But one of the key questions that we always have to ask ourselves is why? I've heard some very impassioned comments today, and I share them, about the importance of saving a mother's life, the importance of saving any life. And that's a wonderful thing. But you know, my colleagues would come to me at times in Uganda, and they'd say to me, Ambassador, great news. We just hit one of our milestones. 80% of people living with HIV AIDS are now on treatment. Or we've saved this many mothers' lives. And that was all really good. But 80%, it's a number. Reducing mortality by 35% in the first year, really cool, but it's a number. The question was, could we tell the people of Uganda, or the people of Zambia, or the people of Nigeria, why the United States of America cares if someone dies from HIV AIDS in Uganda? Why do we care if a mother in Uganda does not survive childbirth? And being able to tell that story, to understand the why of what we do, is as critical as knowing how and what and who, but the why matters. And when we can do that, when we can tell that story as part of a coherent vision of who we are and why we are engaged, it gives so much more strength to what we do. And I hope that it inspires our teams when they know the why of their engagement 
to bring that energy and commitment that you all do. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you. So Dr. Golden, we have heard about uh, Administrator Green's uh, vision for self-reliance. Uh, we have seen just the new report on acting on the call. I wonder if you could speak for a minute about how this fits with USAID's vision for intentional integration and bringing together the different funding streams to be able to attack these critical problems in health. I think that um, is one of the most important questions we have because if we're going to really create a system that the receiving countries can implement and continue, I think we have to have systems that talk to each other, support each other, and have an infrastructure that actually can universally support some of the health systems that are necessary. Um, we, you know, certainly uh, it's easy to see why the funding happens, you know, the way it does from legislation or even from donors because they'll see a specific issue that they're concerned about. I think the transition between having a silo of like malaria care, uh, family planning care, childhood immunizations, maternal care, you know, taking that from the siloed funding and getting it to where it actually creates a platform of services that can integrate like we tried to do with, well, like we did do with this. Um, it's gonna take several layers of response. Uh, I think it, we do need to be advocating for more integration and, more strong, and stronger health systems. I think we need to be looking for how we equip the uh, country and both at our, at our level, at our ambassadorial and um, mission level, and also the countries so that when they have an opportunity to receive these funding streams, they really do them. I see the connecting uh, framework below as an integrated health systems approach that we are addressing the health professions training, we're addressing the uh, IT issues, we're looking at how the financing happens and helping to create the, the sort of a, the innovative methods that are necessary for a long-term fix, not just short-term um, narrow windows on things. So um, yeah, I th it's definitely something we spend a lot of time talking about at USAID. I don't think we've got it all fixed yet, but I think it's something that all of us really are recognizing and working toward actively. Thank you. So Ambassador Burks, you've had lots of experience with different public-private partnerships. You mentioned not only SMGL, but Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon. There's also Dreams. Uh, PEPFAR has been instrumental in all of those because there are HIV outcomes associated with all those goals. Can you speak to us for a minute about what are the key lessons and challenges of putting together a viable public-private partnership and, and what new lessons do you take from all this that you would apply to future partnerships? Wow, that's a great question because we um, look at that all the time because a lot of people come to us um, from the private sector with ideas and concepts. And so at one time PEPFAR had about 25 public-private partnerships and the countries were dying um, because each of these have to be attended to. Partners have to be attended to, um, and it's a lot of work. So we took a very different approach four years ago and doing very specific, very intentional public-private partnerships, matching a real barrier that we had uh, and putting it out there to the private sector and saying, this is our big issue and we can't solve it. Um, that's what we did with Dreams. We said we see not only the youth bulge, but we see the particularly high risk to young women. We see in the Violence Against Children surveys that a third of young women are raped before the age of 15. We have all of these factors, and we know in Uganda the median age is now 14. Um, and we know that by 2020, 60% of Africa will be under 20. So we know all these facts. But we also know that the health system as it exists in sub-Saharan Africa is designed for pregnant women and children under five. So when we talk about the strengthening of the health system, it has to be a different health system. 
it can't be just strengthening the health system. It has to be different. So we put that out to the private sector and said, we want to figure out how to reach young women because he said that he's a diplomat. Well, imagine being an old public health person and trying to talk to a 15-year-old. We know our messages are not appropriate. And people came forward, not only the ones that are part of the Dreams Partnership, which is Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Nike Foundation, Johnson & Johnson, Gilead and Vive, other women's groups came forward with all of their knowledge and said, this is what we know. See if you can use this. I mean, the generosity and wisdom was extraordinary. But Johnson & Johnson and Nike knew actually how to sell things to young girls and young boys. And we wanted to sell something. We wanted to sell a new message of empowerment and safe and educated and thriving young women. Um, and so they helped us really understand how to break down women's lives into age bands of nine to 14 year olds and four, 15 to 19 year olds and try to understand that the messages have to be different for each one. So I think that has been successful because they're meeting a big need that we had and on their side, particularly with Johnson & Johnson, it gave them access to Africa utilizing the PEPFAR brand for Entree because the PEPFAR brand is recognized. And as many countries know, that we are there to support the country and the individuals. And so companies get something out of it also. NGOs get something out of it that haven't had their brand in that particular country. So, it has to be, both people have to win because it's an enormous amount of work. And I think, um, I think it's a real question moving forward, what should the health system look like in the future that is going to meet the needs of the countries and the youth bulge and ensure that young people who perceive themselves as well see themselves as interacting with the health system because well people don't interact with the health system here or there. <laughs> so it's a problem for all of us. And so I think these are challenges that the private sector particularly can help us with. And that has been a thrill. And I just wanna also, there are a lot of people who are outside of the partnership, just like they were in Saving Mothers Giving Life, who brought to us all of their abilities to make us better. And that's really extraordinary when you're in the US government to have all of these women's groups coming to you and say, we've tried this, we've tried this, I think you should do this, I think this will work, um, you gotta look for this, this is what the girl roster looks like, this is how to find the most vulnerable girls, this is what we do. And Girls Not Brides came forward, the Global Educational Partnership. So I think that has been really the thrilling piece. If you have these visions for these partnerships, yet it's clear how they are transforming women and countries and families and communities. I think everybody gets so much out of it that it's been really a thrill for us. Saving Mothers Giving Life, Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon, and now Dreams. And we're out there recruiting for a men's one um, because they are like our final frontier. Um, you thought it was hard to get well women into the clinic. They could at least see other women. It's impossible to get well men into the clinic. So. We've got a whole another group trying to help us do that, cause, and we don't want to do it strictly through beer commercials, because we don't think that's a great <laughs> public health message that we're trying to relay. So if you're not selling beer, but you know how to reach men, come, come help us. We'll have to do another event on that, because there's a, a, a lot to discuss. But Ambassador Delisi, you had mentioned the the challenges, frankly, of the interagency process. Um, and maybe you could speak a little bit more about what can a chief of mission do to herd those cats and to make it in the interests of the different agencies to participate? Um, and what are the risks of that in terms of no agency necessarily owning a program? It's always interesting. <laughs> now, what the chief of mission can do is you can lead. More than anything else, you have to lead. When we are dealing with complex interagency issues, the chief of mission needs to both understand them, even if you're not an expert, but you need to understand them. You need to listen to your people, but then you need to lead and you need to show that this is a commitment of the US government, of the mission as a whole, 
and that we will move forward and we will do it together. But if you're not actively engaged in leading, if I hadn't tried to lead, if my deputy hadn't been actively engaged with me, if we had not created an interagency health team that met regularly, and we didn't miss the meetings, the, my deputy and I, we didn't tell someone else to chair it, we went. Because if we aren't willing to lead, no one else is gonna listen. And if they don't see the ambassador and the DCM actively engaged and taking this seriously, they won't. When I, to digress just briefly, when I, we did a similar thing in Nepal, but it was about disaster risk reduction and preparedness, building an inter interagency team. We would have regular meetings. At the outset, it was hard. And when I would go to the meeting, I'd look about and I would see that perhaps my defense attache was not there or maybe a member of my intelligence team was not there. And I would speak to them, oh, well, I had an appointment, and you would have to remind them, you know, this is why we have a standing meeting. This is why we do it every Tuesday at 10 o'clock or every other Tuesday. And if I can find time on my calendar, can't you find time on yours? Or are you busier than I am? And there, generally the answer was, I'll find time, sir. And that's always what you want. I mean, this is, this is part of it. And it's not to be the school marm or anything else. But you do, people need to know that this is serious and that there will be, that there is leadership on it and that you're committed. But it also means you must understand it. You must care about it. You must be thinking about it. You must be able to talk to your people and advance their agenda and help them to achieve success. And if you can't, always help them achieve success, you have to tell them why we can't. Why something else has to be prioritized. You have to help them see that big picture. And again, it comes down to that fundamental question of understanding where we're going and why we're doing it. We talk about marketing. We talk about pulling everything together. One of our huge challenges was getting the integrated country team and our health group to agree on a communication strategy that we all felt was meaningful and that would articulate the message. And everybody had different views and everyone had different ownership, but you can pull it together. And when you do, when you get your team working together, it's a thing of beauty and you can really we can make a difference. And if we had success in saving mothers giving life, and if the embassy contributed to it, and I believe we did, if we had had success in the fight against HIV AIDS, in malaria, and whatever we did, it was because we had an integrated team that knew what they were doing and why they were doing it. So I thought we could turn to some questions from the audience, and then we're gonna come back, uh, not only to get your final reflections, but to get your onward charge. So you can already be thinking about that as we turn to the audience for some questions. Uh, please, again, identify yourself and wait for the microphone so everyone can hear you. Thank you for this terrific panel. I'm Nabiha Kazi, and I'm a CEO of Humanitas Global. I'm curious, who is not at the table? Who should be at the table, and why? Other questions? Perhaps from our country panel. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, now that we have had this very good experience, and now that we have agreed it's a graduation, the question is, what is the future, for example, in countries where we have funding for HIV, which is vertical, we have funding for malaria, which is vertical. Uh, at the country level, whereas we tr we're trying now to move to a more integrated process, targeting systems, centering the person, the mother and the child, and of course resilience now. <laughs> Do we see a future? Do we see a, an evolution based on this experience that we can actually rally resources around and converge resources 
around the mother, around the child, or and the man now. I, I think there, there's a lot of redundant resources we could actually harness. If it works for women, it can work for HIV in women, it can work for HIV for nutrition in women. And, and we struggle at country level because when we tr start integrating, then we have this challenge. We have to account separately, we have to report separately, we have to, you know, to develop separate, you know. So I, I'm wondering whether there's, there's, a, there's an answer. Maybe there's no immediate answer, but I think it's important for us. Other questions? Right over here. Hi, um, my name is Yuval. I work at the Maternal Health Initiative with um, the Wilson Center. And I was wondering, um, what do you know now that you wish you knew five years ago when this started? Yeah, thank you. All right, let's start with those three. The first one was who should be at the table that wasn't at the table. The second one about the future and perhaps what does this mean for USAID programming and PEPFAR programming? And then what do you wish you knew? So let's start with Ambassador Burks. Okay, those were terrifically insightful questions and difficult. Um, so who is missing? I think we've learned from dreams um, that it's always important to have the voices of the, of the communities that we're serving. And I, mean, I, mean, I, re I was careful not just to say the women because we have found sometimes men to be barriers to women's access. So I think when I talk about community engagement, I mean truly the voices of the community and have them represented because that has been incredibly important to us over the last two to three years and it's really how, why and how we've been able to achieve our goals. And many people, I know some of you know about the COPS and the country operational plans. Those are planned with everybody in the room. Communities there, governments there, stakeholders there, everybody's there together planning from the very beginning on what this program should look like. Um, and just to touch briefly on a couple of the other pieces, um, particularly from our colleague from Uganda. All of our work, um, we have about $750 million a year into the health system. And I think what we're asking ourselves, that, that's way above site, that's at the national or subnational level to strengthen health systems. I think we have to ask ourselves, are we trying to find a 21st century solution? Are we trying to strengthen a 20th century solution that may not be applicable anymore? And I think that's really a very important question because just like we went from dial-up phones to cell phones and you don't see any wires in Africa because they all have cell phones, they skip that whole piece. We may have to skip some pieces into the health system and so I think we have to think about it differently because we invested billions and every meeting I go to we still talk about the supply chain. So there's something, something's not quite right. So I think we've got to really think about really revamping how we're thinking about the health system and see if we can re leapfrog in some way. Um, because we have such a large investment at the above site, that is a horizontal investment. That's in laboratory, data systems, governance, um, epidemiology, surveillance. It's, it's across the board. Um, but it may be that they are too targeted or too down in the weeds and we didn't do the high level stuff and we went originally immediately to the, I, I don't know what the issue is. I just know that I've been at this since 98 in Africa and we're still talking about human resources, yet we've hired hundreds of thousands through PEPFAR and trained hundreds of thousands. We're ta still talking about the supply chain and we're still talking about data systems. And I can tell you, we have built about a thousand hundred data systems, but none of them talk to each other. So we're rethinking that too. I mean, and every donor's built data systems. So you're absolutely right. It's just, and what do I wish we knew? I wish we knew then and I wish I knew now that this program was con would be continued with investment um, because this cannot continue without continued investment. And I think we have to ask ourselves, is a safe pregnancy for every woman worth between 50 and $100? Or is it only worth five? Because that determines whether you can get people to the woman and you can get the woman to the facilities. And that's just the way it is. And I think these are then questions we have to really be comfortable with because these things aren't free. 
And I think governments will be able to do some and they'll be able to create efficiencies, but there also needs to be continued investment from others to make it happen. So I wish I knew then whether the investment would be continue and I wish I knew now. <laughs> Very quickly, my two colleagues here are both with government. I'm not anymore. I used to be, I'm not anymore. So who do I wish was at this ta at, on this panel right now? I wish someone from the administration who was not necessarily someone who has dedicated their lives to these issues, but a policymaker who has to make these decisions about what kind of funding do we bring to the table? What do we value? What, what are we committed to as a nation to be part of this discussion and to hear this discussion as well? I wish, I, I would hope they would be here and I'd love to get a better understanding of what their perspective on all of this might be. In terms of these questions about where do we go, what, what, is, what is coming, how do we deal with all of this, for me it kind of ties into this question of what do I know now that I wish I had known then as well. And I don't know the answer to this question. I certainly am not in a position to speak to resources of the future in that sense. But I think there are fundamental questions as we ask this that we all have to answer, and not just the U.S., but our partners overseas as well. What is our level of commitment? I know the commitment that you bring to the table as a professional who's worked on these issues and cares about them and is passionate. I also know that the leadership of Uganda at least three years ago, maybe things have changed dramatically, I don't know, was not committed. They did not believe that the government's role necessarily was to address issues of health. Infrastructure, yes, make some jobs, provide security, but health, I will let the donors do that. And there was a truth, a truth to that. And when we would look and we would say, do we care more about the future of health in Uganda, the welfare of a person in Uganda, or perhaps Zambia, I don't know the situation there, than the leadership of Uganda? Is there something wrong with this picture? I'm not saying that we shouldn't do it. Absolutely, I believe we should do it. We've done it, we should continue, we have to engage. But this question of defining partnership, our respective roles, as we think about what the future looks like, what kind of partnerships we build that will be effective, that is incredibly important. And I wish I'd had a better understanding of the challenges of partnership and the implications of all of this for how we engage, where we spend our resources, how we spend them, the judgments that we have to make when I started the process as opposed to now. But it was, it's been a fascinating journey, and we all learn in the process. And Dr. Golden, if you could address the way forward for USAID in particular. Okay. Well, I wanted to echo one of the things that Debbie said, and that is that we've learned that we need to have community at the table. And I think uh, I was in Kenya just about three weeks ago, and I went, visited a clinic. And in that clinic, they had three different groups as well that were meeting, as well as the clinical support services that were going on there. One of the groups was, at, and I actually mentioned that the group that has been at the Hearst, you're going to have to hear this again. Okay, all right, all right. So, but uh, one of the groups that was meeting was a male champions group. And they had leaders and men from the community who believed in that they wanted to protect and encourage the women in that village to have antenatal care, to have family planning, and for their children to have immunizations and health services. So having a, bringing the men to the table, I think, was a really important piece there. They also had a group of mentors, young women in their 20s, who were mentoring the young wives and the adolescent girls in the community and talking to them about relationships and family planning and preparing for a family and even going with them when they go into labor if they wanted it. So th that kind of support system. The third group they had there was a group of young people and it was one of our PEPFAR dream type uh, groups. And, and just, I, th I think if you look at those groups and the importance of that kind of community support and what that means to maternal survival. And I believe uh, that our colleague from Nigeria actually, identified that if you have a supportive family, if you have a married young woman, the mortality rates are low. So let's look at how we bring alongside the support systems. And I would include in that the faith-based groups as well. 
Uh, it may be that a lot of the messages that, that need to be delivered in health settings and communities may be well delivered by that, and we need to explore that further and better and have the partnerships with the faith community that, that are more creative. So, going forward, um, I think we need to take the lessons we learned from this. Many of you are aware that on Tuesday afternoon we had an acting on the call, and of course, Dr. Jessica was there, and uh, where, where we presented our materials from the 25 priority countries that USAID supports on maternal and child health. Um, and I think that what we learned from the Saving Mothers Giving Life informs what we do in those other 25 countries. It's already helped, and I think it will continue to help. And so I see going forward, that's an important lesson. But finally, I think it goes back to what you were talking. We're creating partnerships and friendships. We're not creating donor beneficiary relationships. We're moving toward being full friends and partners into the future. And I think when, within, a, within a generation, we're gonna see a very different uh, structure in, in terms of how we partner with our friends from all around the world on these issues. So thank you. So I saw we were joined by Ambassador Storella, who had been ambassador to Zambia at the time, and um, has sometimes called this program a moonshot. So perhaps Ambassador Storella could give us a little bit of his reflections on what it was like at the embassy when he was chief of mission. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, let me say, I'm, I'm delighted to be here and, and so sad to be here a bit late. But I remember getting the call from Lois Quam and uh, saying, can you reduce maternal mortality by 50% in one year? And I thought, wow, that is insane. And um, as, a, as a chief of mission, I thought, is, does it make sense for an embassy to take on something that we already know is impossible? And I remember thinking it was like a moonshot. They're, they're asking us to land a man on the moon. And we brought the team together. And one of the things that, for me, was remarkable about this, how are you? And um, one of the things that was remarkable about this was that, um, in a sense, there wasn't ownership of this program in the way there is in a lot of programs. And so people really dived right in. And one of the things that made, I think, the experience so great for us was that USAID and CDC, uh, Coco Velasquez and uh, Jim McCauley, were the team, the Jim and Coco show. And everywhere they went, uh, they were working together. It brought the team together in a kind of amazing way. And then we had some particularly important partners, uh, Kennedy Malama and uh, Elwin Chomba, uh, people in the Zambian government who were prepared to jump in and say this thing was possible. And I remember, uh, you've all seen um, Apollo 13, where they say, well, how are we gonna save these people? And they put them together with all this junk and say, this is what they've got. That's the way it felt. We were given the opportunity to do almost anything we could think of. And uh, some of you have seen the Zambulance. It, it looks like you know, junk that you'd put together from your garage, but it was an idea. And um, I, I left uh, before it was uh, completed but we had already achieved over 33% reduction in the first year, which I had thought was completely impossible. And I remember uh, walking down the street, or down the street, walking down the hall in the embassy, and we were high-fiving one another and saying, wow, look what happened. It's unbelievable. Um, I would say one thing about this, and I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sure I've missed so many things that have been said that uh, pertain to this. For an ambassador, having a project that really excites people and brings the team together is a gift even if it's something that's almost uh, impossible. And in some ways, it being impossible makes it even better. Um, it, it did things for us, I think, with Zambians. Uh, gave us opportunities to do things together that we didn't really expect. But I look back again on the Apollo program, the moonshot. We landed on the moon on July 20th, 1969. In 1972, we did our last trip to the moon, and we haven't gone back. And when I think about saving mothers, I really wonder. I, I think we had a moonshot, and we achieved something that was really quite remarkable. And for a variety of reasons, uh, the program's uh, winding down. But I hope we don't lose the excitement. I hope we don't lose the sense of, of possibility. And uh, you wonder who's going to the moon next? Is it going to be the Chinese, or will it be the United States again? I just hope that we are part of the leadership of uh, taking on a really big worldwide change in maternal uh, mortality.
So we're going to close up with uh, final reflections from all our panelists and any onward charge you might have for the audience, for the US government, for our country partners, for our private partners, for community leaders. Um, and are you telling me they're going to show the video? And then at the end of that, they'll try again to show the video that was going to be shown at the start that's about saving mothers giving life. So first to our panel, Dr. Golden. We have much to celebrate, and we have much to do. And I think that we, uh, I, I loved some of the comments that came out through the other panels where we talked about having a commitment that had alignment, but we checked all of our egos at the door. And I think that's, that's going to give us a pathway to get much more done over the next generation because we not only have each other for partners, we have our countries for partners as well. Thank you. One of the great challenges, I think, that we face, I listened today, and again, there's tremendous passion in this room. Passion to save mothers, to save children, to fight HIV AIDS. And we know that we care, and we know why we care, and that's, that's a really good thing. And I remember at uh, one of the PEPFAR conferences, it might have been you, Ambassador Briggs, it might have been somebody else who said, you know, this is great because we've got this tremendous degree of bipartisan support on the Hill. And they said that this was the best reflection of American values that we could offer, our commitment to fight this disease across the world. And I think the work that we've done in saving, uh, saving mothers and global health in general, this again is a tremendous reflection of our values. And I think that that matters. But I would suggest that we also need to be able to find a way to ensure that we can articulate those values in such a way that we can demonstrate to those who fund, to those who might not always believe that values matter, that this is also the best articulation and the best way to protect our interests in the world as well. That when we stand for our values, when we know who we are, that this is what distinguishes us. This is what builds the successful partnerships that will best allow us to protect our interests. Interests and values go hand in hand, and there are those who want to divorce them at times. They cannot, but we need to look beyond just our passion and our commitment to be able to make the hard case to those who would try to divorce these two concepts. So that's, one of the, that's the challenge, and I would say the charge is, again, we have seen this play out with Saving Mothers and with PEPFAR, but I think it's true across the range of issues that we deal with in the foreign affairs arena today. The problems we face in today's world are so much more complex, so much more challenging and daunting than they were 35, 40 years ago. The idea that there's a State Department set of issues and a CDC set of issues and USAID issues and commerce issues. No, there are US government issues. There are issues for all of us, for mankind. But if we're going to tackle them, if we're going to be successful, we need to build on the model we have here. We need to build more innovative and entrepreneurial and creative approaches to how we engage these challenges. And we need to build these partnerships that in combine governments, academia, the nonprofits, the for-profits, the faith communities in order to tackle these, these huge issues. And even then, we're going to be challenged to succeed. But we can't succeed unless we think differently. So that challenge of thinking differently, that's what I'll leave you with. I think we all have to try. Great, thank you. Um, you know I'm going to say you need to have data down to the site level because it's the only way. If you can't see that mother and if you can't see that baby, then you don't know if you have a good program. Averages are a tyranny that are killing people. So if you really need to see people through your data. And so I, I challenge all of the program managers to go back and see if they can see all of their data across all these global health programs down to the site. Because if you can't, you're missing things. Because what we found is 80% of the problems are in 20% of the sites. 
So if you just go to every site, which no one can do because there's not enough people on the planet, you'll never get at the correction where it needs to be. So I think you know we really need to continue to use data. Secondly, I just want to reassure Ambassador DeLisi and the rest of the audience, we have tremendous support from this administration. We absolutely do. Secretary Pompeo is very devoted to PEPFAR. He knows PEPFAR. Vice President Pence knows PEPFAR. I refer you back to a 2008 speech he gave. But imagine when you have a program that's called the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, and you go through three presidents and eight Congresses, and they're all still with you. So, I mean, that is what can happen. Um, so we need to be optimistic that people, when we have something great, and when we have the data to prove that it's great, people will come with us, and they'll come with us through administrations and through year after year as we move forward together. Thank you all so much. I think uh, we could go on for much longer because these, uh, your insights and your perspectives are so valuable. And I think you give us some things to think about and work on going forward. There's so many, and we'll be eager to be working with all of you. And I guess one of the players that isn't always at the table that I find myself wishing uh, we could all do better on is uh, getting the message out to the American public so that they understand the value of global health, the importance of these programs, the importance of the partnerships with the countries themselves, and that the small, tiny piece of the U.S. budget that is devoted to global health and development is really an important set of investments. And I'm not sure Americans always understand that, but if they could have listened to all of the panelists today, I think they would have had a better idea. So please join me in thanking the panel, and then you can watch the video.